call this meeting to order. Um, so the first thing is just to explain uh, some logistics. Uh, so if you're joining remotely, if you would uh, change your name to be your first and last name, um, uh, so I can con you properly. Uh, when you speak, if you could stay your name and where you live, um, try to keep your comments to under two minutes if you could. And Donna is going to help us out with that in terms of um, timing. She's got a card. She'll let you know when you're at one minute and then when at, you're at two. Um, yep. Just for the people online. Oh, you want to talk to the end of your mic, though? Thank, Thank you. you. It's uh, OK. For the people online, I'll put this in front of my face so they can look at my screen and see it. Just yeah, to sometimes remind it's them. not in focus. Do you but they can see the exactly. yellow and they can see the red. OK. Yes? Sure. Tell me how far I can put it. <laughs> Maybe I can get it focused. Yeah, just be conscious of that. Yes, but, uh, yes, I, but I, I think that's good. that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, if uh, yeah, so please keep your comments to um, germane to the topic. Uh, if you have something to say that is related to something on our agenda, then you can make that comment generally as we get to that item. If it is not on our agenda, then general business and appearances is the um, best time to do that. Uh, and uh, if you wish to speak, you just need to wait for me to call on you. Um, and if you have multiple questions, if you could like pack them all together, because um, we don't generally like to get into a back and forth kind of um, uh, comments here. Uh, all right, I think that is it. So any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. So with that, we will consider the agenda approved. Uh, general business and appearances. Uh, yeah, so if there is anyone who would like to make a comment on a topic that is not on our agenda, uh, now is the time. And we'll start with folks in person. Steve Whitaker. Uh, I want to protest the two minute limit. It's arbitrary, it's not consistent with open meeting law. Uh, when I have a lot of topics to cover. Uh, the dust, the, the street sweeper might not be here for a year. We've got a dysfunctional street sweeper that leaves as much behind as it picks up. So I think that the council members should be like the dunk tank at the carnival. You should be out walking on Main Street and eating dirt the way all the rest of us are. You know, it, it's the only thing that's gonna drive home the point that we need either men with shovels and brooms or a vacuum cleaner. I proposed a vacuum cleaner several years ago after Steve Everett found it in Europe, be in use in Europe, and it's electric. You can, you know, pat yourself on the back and buy one that one person can pull around town and vacuum up the sidewalks and the unaccessible uh, traffic calming uh, places where the street sweeper can't go. Um, I mentioned the fire escape being blocked by a Christmas tree since last Christmas. Uh, I mentioned it two weeks ago. It's still there. Uh, it's like, where is our enforcement? Uh, where is our permit enforcement of Jacob's building falling into the river? His dumpster overflowing uh, across from Bent Nails and, and going directly into the river. And those cardboard boxes sat down there before, since before cleanup day, green up day, and then floated away because nobody's going to climb down the riverbank. Right now, the dumpster is, you know, way over, overfilled, and the lid is resting on the guardrail. So anything that rolls down from the overfill goes directly to the river, as does the human feces that y'all refuse to, you know, deal with. You, you, your toilets committee has not met in a year, and that's absolutely untenable. It's, it exposes the disingenuousness of this council's priorities. You know, the uh, riverbanks behind Shaw's, the quantities of garbage and trash and tarps and everything that's just, you know, floating away at every high water. And y'all pretend that everything on your agenda is environmentally sustainable and pretty. And you're just deluding yourselves. Uh, there's still public records requests. I made a request for administrative processing. I was denied records related to the water. I think there's a cover up going on because there's no excuse for not giving me the records that I was assured I could have in a machine readable Excel format. I did find out from the documentation that the software does export in Excel <coughs> format. And you just, you, you allow him to continue to break the law and you don't hold him to account. For, for the record, he was provided the record. You're interrupting my two minutes time. 
Yeah. I was yeah, not provided the records. I, I will, I'll, I'll go into it if you want to make the time for it. I will ha be happy what I was provided and what I was not. A PDF, a fixed PDF of records is different than an export, a Excel spreadsheet which I can find anomalies and do calculations within. That's a big difference. And the software does export PDFs and we, John and I met with the Secretary of State about that. And so, so, Steve, you're at three minutes. You're, you're at three minutes now. So, if you I'm could wrap up done. your uh, comments, thank we you. We had a blowout of a pipe, or we didn't, but City Center had a blowout yesterday, and the m lack of maintenance, the chronic lack of maintenance, dating for at least the entire tenure of Bill Frazier, has left. It took nearly an hour to get the valve turned off, while tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, of gallons went down the drain, and and undermined a big sinkhole in the driveway. They'll be repair they're repairing it today and tomorrow. Great. Thank you so much, Steve. Um, all right, so we're going to move on. I still have a couple nope, more nope. items. Y thank you. You've already used up more than your two minutes. I, so I'm allowed so more much. than two minutes no, under law. No, you are not. Thank you so you much, are Steve. Not a, have, the Steve, I ha I'm asking you to stop, and you need to go sit down now. Thank you I'm so much. Finish no, time. that is incorrect. This is your first warning, Steve. If I have to speak to you again, I'm going to ask well, you to leave. You'll, then I'll, you can do that. Steve, so uh, so my, are you? St who paid for the flags? Steve, the I am asking you I'm, to sit down. Uh, you gave me my warning. I'm going to finish my list. No, you are done now. Thank and you I so much. And I also think you ought to know how many Steve, strangers are coming up to me thanking Steve, me for holding you your feet to, to the fire. I'm asking you to leave. Twice now, you have talked over me. I gave you a warning. You're and talking you, and over you, me, ma'am. No, you refused. So I'm asking you to leave now, Steve. Thank you very much. And I'm if, not if you are not going to leave uh, of your own volition, I'm going to ask that you be escorted out. I'm entitled to be here under public records law, under open meeting law. Mr. Cite me. Cite me trespassing in a public meeting? No. You can write your write your site. No. Don't put your hands on me. Don't you dare put your hands on me. Okay, I'm I'm an adult and I'm gonna hold my ground. Go write your citation and hand it to me. Is it, a, is it, well, how would you feel about taking a, just a quick yeah. break? Yeah. Yeah. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, team. Let's take a quick break. Thank you for uh, sticking with us here, team. Um, we are still in general business and appearances. Um, if there's anyone in person who would like to make a comment, now is the time. Yes, go ahead. hard act to follow. Uh, my name is Richard Shear, and I live on Loomis and I am not here in a litany of complaint tonight. I'm here to commend the council and ask the city manager if he will explain tomorrow night's meeting, a uh, virtual meeting at five o'clock and how to access that meeting and what the meeting is about. I think it's a great idea. I think it's long overdue and I want to commend the mayor and council for setting it up. I think I still have a minute and 30 seconds left. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank, you thank you, Richard. And uh, I, I'm afraid I can't accept any credit for this. This was 100% on the chief of police who uh, set up, is what he's talking about is the chief has set up an open town meeting for him just to deep, for anybody who wants to debrief the situation with the, the student who who guns were taken away from the the alleged threat at the high school 
Uh, he had promised when that was once that was concluded that he would make himself available for people, and so he's got a online forum. I don't have the link. I think it's on our Facebook and website and front porch forum and those kinds of things for people that wish. But it is at five o'clock tomorrow, and it would be with Chief Pete. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else in person wish to make a comment? Okay, um, Vicki Ann Lane, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Um, there's something a little hanky about your, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, because you all stopped moving. Um, there's something a little hanky about the feed tonight, so maybe if somebody could um, could investigate that a little bit. It comes and goes and things like that. Um, and I, I do hope, I mean, I was looking at some of the facial expressions uh, while you were taking a break, and I do hope that you weren't enjoying yourself, because that, that was difficult. Although it may have been a long time coming, that was difficult to see. Yeah, yeah thank you, Vicki. Um, yeah, it was also difficult to uh, be a part of. Um, all right. Uh, anyone else with us virtually? Okay. All right. So we're going to move on to the consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion? Yes, Jack. Move the consent agenda. Second. There's motion and a second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Uh, okay, uh, so the next item is a legislative wrap up and I know we have um, at least uh, one person with, a, with us here in person and um, one person with, with us here virtually. So um, I'm going to invite you, um, Representative Hooper, up to the, the table and uh, Senator Perchlick, uh, uh, if you want to uh, turn on your camera, that would be great. Oh, there you are. Great. Um, and uh, we have a, a committee uh, dedicated to this. So I'm going to turn it over to you all um, to lead this part, or if you have if you have questions, or we could or we could start with uh, the representatives and and, and senators. <laughs> um, I, can, I can jump okay, in. Yeah, as, go ahead. As the staff Thank person you. for that committee. Um, so at our last meeting, Councilmember Hurl, who is a member of our our legislative committee, just thought. Um, It'd be a good idea to to see where we how we ended up with the session, what of interest to us passed, what didn't, what we still need to work on, and just get a general sense to touch base with our folks. And thank you all for the work you've done, particularly Representative Hooper, and for your long career. And um, so I th that was really it. I don't know that there's a firm agenda there. I mean, just in particular. Um... So good to see you, Representative Hooper. Um, and, you know, a lot of conversation. So there's obviously the policy action and then just with the unusual budget and if there's opportunities that in what passed with ARPA funding and so on that you want to just make sure that the city's aware of. I mean, our staff's amazing, as you know, and, you know, scouring everything, but just to make sure that we're, you know, setting the city up um, as successfully as possible with this short-term um, funding opportunities. So that was part of why we were uh, appreciate having you here. Thanks. And good to see you, Senator Perchel. Anything you want to say, Connor? Oh, oh okay. Well said, but okay. I would echo thanks so much, uh, Representative Cooper, who announced her retirement recently, and uh, for all you've done for the city, both in the municipal capacity um, and in the state house. So thanks so much. Thank you. And am I sitting too far away? I think yeah. so, yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I wanted to go right over. Right on. Pull it, pull it right over to you. Do you mind if I? No, move. Oh, go for it. No. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to be able to see you. But having said that, I'm taking these off. Because <laughs> I can't see because I fog and yeah. Um, so thank you for the invitation to be here, and I hope. It, it feels so odd for you all to call me Representative Hooper. Um, I am Mary. Uh, and I do hope Senator Perchlick will will jump in or he'll do his own thing. I didn't come with uh, prepared comments, but I did, um, thanks to Mary Smith 
uh, remind myself of what your legislative agenda was. And I think that we have taken a number of really important steps um, in a variety of areas of, of interest to the city. Um, we have made historic investments in housing, and um, I feel really fortunate that we have such great city staff and community partners that I hope we will leap on that as as quickly as we can to take advantage of what is there. Um, so there's there's money for the development of housing, but there is also money, say, for planning of accessory dwelling units. Um, so I urge you to take advantage of that. I, I know the Agency of Commerce and Community Development is a little worried that we put too much money in that area, but there, there are funds there. I know that's of an interest to the city. So there's, there's good money there. Um, I'm personally really, really proud that the state made the commitment to assure that everybody was housed during the pandemic. And we've been able to do that. And we have continued to do that to provide housing to people who desire it. Um, what I'm really sad about is that what we thought was going to be an opportunity that would go through. So we're approaching state fiscal year 23. We thought that we would have sufficient federal fund funding to get us to state fiscal year 25 to really create a great path for people who need permanent housing. So build that permanent housing, have a great path to keep folks housed. The way the federal government is rearranging its money, those funds are going to go away in, um, I always get breathless when I have this thing. So I, I know my voice is being wavery. I just can't breathe. <laughs> um, the, uh, the funding is going to go away for that program in all likelihood in the third quarter of FY23. So March, April, May sometime through there. And um, that's really worrisome and concerning. We tried to put some breaks and some back and forth so that we, this, we the legislature could manage that. I'm on the committee that they're supposed to be reporting to, so I get to watch it for at least another six months or so. But I know this is something that we're all going to need to pay really close attention to. We put in money in language that said if there were available state dollars that we would spend them or they could be available to spend in that last quarter of the fiscal year. It looks like there's going to it's going to be available, but that's going to be a decision of the next legislature. So watch that one closely, please. Um, so that's housing. We made really remarkable investments also in um, in the climate arena and also in clean water. And again, I hope that, again, we have such great city staff that we can really jump on it, particularly in the clean water uh, arena. There's, there's massive amounts of money that are there. And in my experience, it moves to the people who are prepared for it. Um, so another good area to be looking at. We also put um, funding in S11 for ah, the economic, what, what the state was looking for, for economic recovery grants. The legislature has never been too fond of those. So we created a program with $40 million that um, municipalities, nonprofits, and businesses could apply to that they could do um, economic development work. Read the details of it. It's in S11. It's just signed into law today, I think. Um, it's designed to go to areas with declining grant lists. 
I'm not sure that sounds like Montpelier, but I would still take a deep look at that. I was thinking about that in terms of, say, the public bathrooms that have been a priority, that maybe that would be something that um, y'all could, could apply for. Um, I could ramble on, uh, but I don't want to. I'd rather answer questions that you have. Um, we did, to the best of my recollections, not take particularly strong action on PFAS, PFASs, unless somebody wants to correct me. I, when you're in the Appropriations Committee, you go in there and you're so unaware of so much else that goes on in that building. Um, yeah, let me stop there. See, and give Senator Perchlick a, a, a chance, but also answer questions if I can. Sure. Um, before we jump to Senator Perchlick, any questions for Mary? At this point? Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Mary, what do you think is the future of sort of the hotel voucher program uh, for homelessness? I was just talking to a worker the other day that said some of these hotels are really increasing rates and have full capacity. Yeah. I don't know if the number's right. I heard like at 150 a night at like full capacity. And you just mm -hmm. do the math on that. And it's like, you're talking millions, you know, yeah. uh, for a single hotel. So I, I didn't know if that's sustainable or if there's maybe a shift in approach on that. That's the program that I was referring to that we had hoped would continue for a year or more longer and it's not going to. Um, yes, I have heard that there is a view that um, the hotel owners are seeing a, a good profit. That's been one of the interesting things in this is it's fabulous that we were able to house folks on it in just, just, I should also acknowledge under really pretty cruddy conditions. There's no way, I mean, thank heavens we have a roof over people's heads, but the thought of there being kids living in motel rooms for a year or two or even three is just really horrifying. Um, and there are, I, I haven't looked at the numbers recently, but we were still at well over 2000 people that we were housing and 500 of them were children. Um, so really, really distressing. It's a cobbled together program. Bottom of the line, it's cobbled together and it's continued to be cobbled together. I would have hoped that if we had, if it had had the lifespan that we wanted, that we would have spent more time figuring out how to make it better. But my focus is to how to figure out now how to do a fair transition out of that program. But I've heard similar concerns and uh, and also that people have refused permanent housing where where they have to uh, use some of their own income to meet the housing needs whereas they're receiving free housing under the current circumstances it's complicated there's so there, there's so many there, every story is individual and and hard and so i'm not surprised that there we hear the stories that we do Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, Don. When you're talking about housing, Mary, did this did the state ever look into increasing the program to prevent people to become homeless? I know it became a focus in some areas to look at where people were sliding into trouble. Yeah. Was there any money or focus? Yeah, there were actually pretty massive amounts of money. It's the same program that is paying for the so-called hotel voucher program. The acronym is ERAP emergency rental assistance program and it was also available to anybody and continues to be available to folks to pay um to help with rent uh i i'm forgetting the details but but a significant air effort was made both to help folks with with rent or first and last if they're moving to new circumstances and other programs that were available to um, folks uh, for um, who own their homes, who may need assistance with tax payments or other other provisions, including paying uh, utility bills. So it, it, 
thanks to the rather phenomenal federal, federal largesse, we were able to try to look at a whole variety of areas of, of ways to preserve housing, to construct more housing or rehab more housing, as well as to shelter folks. Um, that thought, thought went through and, and kept going. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> yeah. that, that was good. But I also just wanted to thank you personally. You definitely carried the ball in getting the regional public safety dispatch centers uh, through. So appreciate that very much. It was yeah. very important to us. Thank you. Yeah, I, I know it was. That's that's something else that the Joint Fiscal Committee will continue to watch and we we will watch. I, I know it was important to Montpelier. I really worry about what, what is going to happen on a statewide basis and that there isn't a good plan in place for what are we going to do on a statewide basis. And when this money goes away, I don't know what we're going to do to attend to other people's needs. It, it, this amazing bubble that we're on is that there's something very frightening on the other side as we have to figure out how to manage within the state's resources. Um, and that will probably be in, I was worried that FY24 would bring the hard times, the really hard times where we see cutting, but I think it may stretch out to 25. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, go ahead. Just quickly on housing, um, you mentioned that there was a lot of money going to housing and you mentioned planning funds for ADUs. Are there other funds that municipalities can access? I've, been, I've heard there's a lot that if you're a housing developer, you can get, but what can a local government do to assist? Is there, are there funds available for that or should I ask? elsewhere? <laughs> we, we have tended to lean really heavily, as has the city, on and other municipalities on the local housing developers, so downstreet, et cetera. And so that's been the, the majority of it. So there is it also would be those private... sort of nonprofit developers, not necessarily just someone who wants to put in this big subdivision oh. that we could help with. Are, are there funds available to assist people with infrastructure or anything that might happen? Well, so to my point about the massive amounts of money right. available for infrastructure, um, you know, they are there. There are the federal match requirements, although there's interesting maybe opportunities with the IIJA where you can use federal money to f match federal money. Um, so let me, let me kind of delve into the memory banks. It's not the, the, the thing that is also there that I think was an interesting experiment that'll be to watch is that we put a, a good deal of money into um, into the private hand, make, we're making money through the HFA available in the private sector for the re reconstruction of existing properties or, or, or also the development of new properties. So that could be, sorry, that could be um, an area that, that is worth exploring. If you had a partner in the, in, with a private developer who can access the funding that's available there, um, you know, the city could figure out how, I mean, the obvious, I, I wish that we would spend more time trying to figure out how to lay sewer and water and streets and lights and just get ready for the development. And you have kind of a turnkey where you let the developer come in, but there may be opportunities for partnership there. And that would be in S226 is the bill to read. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Any other questions for Mary at this point? Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Senator Pershlik. Thank you, and thanks for for having me here. And thank you, Mary, Representative Hooper, for your for your work and explaining a lot of the budget things. Uh, like Representative Hooper, it's hard to call her Mary, but uh, like Mary. I didn't like prepare a specific thing, but looking just at the last kind of emails we had with the 
city council on the priorities. It seems like some of them we were successful of them on, some of them not, like public bathrooms in the city, trying to find a way to, to get that to work. I think it should be a state responsibility. I think it's an issue not, it's an issue for the state as well as for the city. So there should be cooperation on that in the future. So I'm hopeful we can find a way to work on that. I don't know what happened to the TIF issue. I know that was on the list and I know Senator Cummings was working on that. <clears throat> That I wasn't involved, so I'm not sure how that turned out for this. What the what the city's priorities were there. You know, I was on, as you might know, on transportation and education, so I focused on there. One other issue that I think came up last year, that at one of these meetings, was the issue about people's titles for their properties in the racist language that folks had found in their titles. Uh, former council. Person Richardson had had worked on that and was helpful in his new roles. And he, I had introduced, introduced the bill after a council meeting like this. I couldn't get the Senate Judiciary Committee to take it up, but the House did passed it, and the Senate Judiciary Committee did take up that bill and passed it. You know, we we can't clean that language completely out. We can't go into the to the records and you know actually scissor out that language but there you know the the law allows a way to address the issue which i thought was you know we we did what we could do and i applaud the council for bringing it up as a city priority when they did the i also just thought communication was better one of my goals was just to be able to know more about what the city wanted i think this was of the four years that i've been doing it. I think we talked the most this year. I don't know. It's up to you to tell me whether that was good or bad, if, if it helped. I, I felt like it, at least I knew what, what, what the city's position was or what they were looking out for. So I, that's that's helpful, whether we were able to deliver on that, I guess, is up for you guys to decide. The other couple of things that I think I brought up before that it's, it's more wait and see is with the schools. The, the waiting study passed, signed by the governor, that is going to be good for students across the state. It's going to be a positive step forward on equitable education, uh, but it could mean a sizable property tax increase for the residents. And so that's something that the city is going to have to be watching and pay attention to as you do your own municipal budget, what the impact of that is. And then there's the PCBs uh, issue. I'm not sure where the Montpelier schools lined up on the list of priorities but we did provide a lot of funding, making sure that all schools will be tested and some money set aside for remediation. There's also some money that the state put aside of ARPA money that is available to schools that are Title I schools, which are considered quote unquote high poverty schools. And actually Montpelier schools qualify, not all the schools, it, it's this ratio of, per district, but there is some money for Montpelier schools. I think, strangely enough, like the high school and the elementary are eligible, but not the middle school. Uh, don't ask me why, but uh, there's some money for HVAC and other heating and air conditioning and air quality money that I think the it's more of a question for the school board or more of a something to highlight for the school board than you guys. But I thought I'd just bring that up as something that I that I worked on that I think the city might be able to benefit from. So that's, I know I, I worked a little bit on the dispatch stuff on the Senate side, but uh, you know, folks in appropriations and other committees were the ones uh, mostly focused on that, but I helped where I, where I could. So that's all I really have to do as my report, but happy to answer any, any questions. Uh, uh, the other thing I did is supported, which really give credit to the house members on transportation to support not only a bunch of climate stuff, but really looking out for town budgets when it comes to the amount of money that the state flows down to towns. And I supported the house position on that, which will provide a little more money for, for the town to do its road infrastructure work. Great. Thank you so much. Um, any questions? Yeah, go ahead, Connor. Yeah, sure. Thanks a million, Senator. Um, <clears throat> question on, uh, you know, our my ride program in town, I think has been generally pretty successful, you know, um, 
you know, it's uh, not just going in circles anymore. And, you know, folks with mobility issues off Town Hill Road can have it come to their doorstep now. So I, I think it's been really good, except, you know, we don't feel like we're up to full capacity. The wait times are long, which has been a deterrent from some people doing it. And I think my concern is GMT looking to expand to other communities before we feel like we're really where we should be, you know. So I, I was wondering what the status of that is and if there's any way to sort of say, okay, let's do it right in Montpelier before looking elsewhere. Yeah, I agree with you other than I, I hear mostly from people that are not happy with it. So, but maybe uh, that's just the way it goes in government. You hear from the people that are that are complaining more than the people that are happy with it. But I, I have a lot of hope and optimism for on-demand transportation services like my ride. I think there are some issues that need to be worked out for sure about people that don't have phones, about what you do during peak times and other issues. But I think that they're, 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 they're fixable. And maybe there's a fixed route somewhere where a lot of people need that. And there's other ways of addressing the, the shortcomings of that. But I don't think it's, I think agency of transportation considers it a success and wants to keep working on it. One thing that I did do in Senate transportation is increased the budget for microtransit up to three million, three and a half million dollars, so that there could be some more funding. We didn't direct, you know, we're not directing where they're going to send that, but I know Capstone and Barry is working on a, a, a similar project. Maybe there's an opportunity for that money to also help uh, the, the Montpelier My Ride. I think one thing that would be really helpful is some money to get different buses. I think it would work a lot better in, with vans than the cutaway buses, or at least part, part of the time. So the, the short answer is there is more money. I can't promise that the state AOT would grant more money to Montpelier because there is there is a lot of interest amongst towns across the state that really want it and want to figure out, can it work for their rural communities? Because they're pretty confident that they're never going to get a fixed bus service in some of these small towns, but they think they can do uh, an on-demand my ride type of project. So I'm, I'm very supportive of it and hope to that there's some more money available for the city because I, I agree with you, it'd be good to figure out exactly what is needed to do it the right way. And then, then other towns and cities could learn from that. Okay. Great, yeah, anybody else? Okay, oh yes, Lauren, go ahead. Just a couple other um, bills that passed that might be of interest to council. Um, there, there was not a PFAS ban bill, but there was a bill on um, medical monitoring for people impacted by toxic chemicals. But another part was allowing the state to sue chemical manufacturers if their impacts to public resources, natural resources, or facilities like wastewater treatment facilities. So I think that could just be good for us to know down the road, um, knowing um, you know, the potential contamination issues. Um, so that would be the state, it wouldn't be the city, but it could be something that just for us to know that that is a new legal remedy that the state authorized this year. Um, the state also passed an environmental justice bill. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of work and I think just very in line with our city strategic plan and um, values. So a lot of work of looking at getting more communities more involved in city government and impacts of, you know, making sure every person has access to a clean environment and nobody's being disproportionately burdened by environmental harm. Um, so that will be going on. And um, I don't know how the city will be involved exactly, but it will be impacting how kind of a &R to start and city government more broadly is going to be looking at um, environmental issues. Um, and then finally, the Municipal Energy Resilience Initiative was signed um, last week. So that's the bill that created grants for municipalities for up to $500,000 for climate um, investments um, for municipal buildings and uh, doing efficiency or renewable energy projects. So that's exciting too. And just thank you. <laughs> thank you. I, I should have mentioned that 518, uh, the municipal program, because there's a lot of money in, in there and not only money for the projects but energy engineers and building engineers that will come and work with the city to find the most cost effective measures that could be done so i think that's definitely something the city should be raising their hand with and working with both buildings general services and the vermont league of cities and towns is going to be running that program it was interesting that the governor signed the the medical monitoring because it's one bill that he's vetoed before but 
he vetoed a lot of bills this year, but that was one that he did, which is good. Yeah, just one question about that. So we are advertising right now for a sustainability coordinator, um, and but we also do have a, where we had a, a person who would have been responsible for doing a lot of grant or grant managing. Um, do you anticipate? I mean, I'm hoping that we are going to go after you know this and some of the other money that has been mentioned. You know, um, some of the um, items that Mary uh, mentioned as well. Um, uh, do these, so is the new person who, the, like the new Kevin, basically, oh, uh, is it's Josh? Josh. Josh, right, yes. Um, will he be the one that's writing these grants or, um, you know, for the uh, uh, resiliency, municipal resiliency grants, do you anticipate that um, the probably new person? Probably him or the new okay. person. That's probably too much in the weeds, but I'm just, I'm really excited to go after some of this money. Um, so just thinking about logistics of making that happen. Great. Um, super. Yeah. Do you have anything? I, I remembered one other thing yeah, that I wanted to ask you all to watch next year. One of the teeny things <clears throat> that I've done ever since I've been on the appropriations committee is to watch our pilot payments and to say, come on, we can find a little more money. And you know, that comes from the sales tax revenue from the local options tax. That pot is very full. There is a lot of money there. I was all ready to say, okay, let's put some more in. Here's a problem that I didn't understand until the waning days of the legislature, which is that in fact, in statute, it says that we that those funds are distributed based on the insurance value of the state properties. It's not on their appraised or it, appraised value. So the state gets to treat itself, how it manages its program entirely differently than it requires every municipality to do, which makes me nuts. But what I am really concerned about is that my soon to be former colleagues are going to see that there is a good deal, there will be be an increasing amount of money sitting in that local options pot that um, will not be able to be distributed because of the way the statute reads. And so I would hope that we change the statute to say that the state has to assess properties in the same way that, that it requires of municipalities. But it is something to be watched. And I don't know, but I think there was a study of alternative uses of it in some tax bill. It is This has never been something that our tax committee has been particularly fond of, and they keep, have over the years tried to whittle away at that. So watch the whittling, please. That, that one, I, it, the city of Montpelier by the standards that are being used is over 90% at, at its 90% of the insurance value. So um, we're almost at the cap and it's gonna be hard to add much more to that. So watch it, please. Thank you for that. That's really good to know. Do you mind? Yeah, yeah that's always been a, a pet peeve that they get to decide how much taxes they pay and what basis they, they pay it on. Um, and what we got at the League of Cities and Towns was that there was talk of or a suggestion from the taxing committee that, that these funds be converted to some sort of general revenue sharing to get towns and cities and not, you know, so it maybe do away with local options taxes it, and those entirely. Kind of so, um, which doesn't really impact the communities who actually have the, the action, you know, the local options tax are in those communities have a lot of activity. Right. Um, and so they need the extra funding. So we'll see. Yes, we're watching it closely. There has historically not been very much sympathy for those communities that, you know, Montpelier, you know, that Burlington has Bay extra area. services yeah. because of the number of people who come in. Um, yeah. So I hadn't heard about revenue sharing. That's an interesting idea. I bet it until, turns until the appropriation goes away. Yeah. Um, Peter Kelman, I see you've got your hand up. Go ahead. 
Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm uh, on the My Ride Community Action Group, uh, uh, sorry, Community Advisory Group. I've been on it since My Ride began. Um, I, I'd like to suggest that you invite um, uh, uh, Green Mountain Transit to make a report on My Ride. Uh, Connor's description of it does not match with um, what we've uh, on our, in our group have um, learned. Uh, first of all, let me just say two things. One, my ride was a pilot. It is a pilot from which we are learning a great deal. Um, and one of the things that we were learning is that having Barry have a similar situation would be good for Montpelier, would not detract at all. Uh, there's so much um, movement between Barry, Montpelier, and Berlin, um, that uh, it, it, it would be terrific, in fact, if, if it was expanded. Um, also, uh, there are not long delays. You have occasional delays, which are an artifact of many factors, including people booking and then leaving. It's, it's a much more complicated situation. In fact, we just had a report, of, a data report from actual data and the Montpelier um, my ride is outperforms almost any other similar uh, um, system in anywhere in the, in, in, the, in the world, not just in our country. It's actually very successful. And I, I really uh, suggest that you have a report on it and get the facts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we do usually have, thank you for that. Uh, Peter, we do usually have GMT come in, and it's usually around budget time. Actually, they're scheduled. They were originally going to come tonight. I think. They're oh, really? Coming next meeting. Oh, okay, great. On the schedule. Well, but excellent. They're, they're due to come in very soon. Okay, that's that's great. Okay. Mayor Wilson. Right. Oh, uh, yes. Go ahead. It, it just reminded me one other thing. If I can just uh, toot my own horn on transportation, one of the issues that came up with with transit is the I link bus to Burlington. Uh, they cut a, one of the buses. And so I heard a lot of, from people in Montpelier that instead of being able to take the bus to Burlington, they had to drive their car and with the cost of fuel prices going up and just the amount of time and effort that it took. Uh, they were saying, why are we why are we cutting this service at this time and also continuing the fare for free? There was a little bit of a discussion of like what, what's more important free fares for the buses or this more service. I was able to restore some of the service. I think it's was restored June, the first week of June, maybe it's today, June 8th was the day that they were gonna restore that uh, iLink commuter bus to Burlington. And so some, some routes like those commuter routes might start charging fares, but they won't cut service. And I think it's a good trade-off where there are some services we want to fare free. And that's what I think that's really important. I support the fare free effort, but I really didn't want to see the bus, uh, the service cut so that there weren't the same number of trips every day for those folks that are working, you know, up along the I-89 corridor. So we're, we're those bus, if you talk to anybody that was concerned about that one morning bus to Burlington that got cut, it is being restored. If it wasn't restored today, it's being restored a couple of days ago or in a couple of days. Great, that's great news. I also heard about that as well. And I um, used to take that, that bus when I didn't live in Montpelier. And so I'm glad to hear that it is uh, back. Um, for the, for the yes. work of GMT scheduled for July 20. So oh. not next meeting, the one after. Okay, great. All right, any further questions uh, for our delegation here? Okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for your service uh, yeah. this past session and sessions prior. Yeah. Uh, we're so grateful. Um, and yeah, we'll be in touch. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you all for the work you, you do. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so we have some appointments to make. Uh, so to the development review board, and I know we have uh, some folks here for that. Um, so if you are one of the applicants for, or yeah, that's the right word, um, for um, the development review board, if you would come up and introduce yourself uh, and just tell us about 
you're interested in staying on the committee or um because i think all these people are currently on the development Some review ones, board yeah. um so yes hi i'm uh, rob goodwin i don't know if i met all of you chair of the grb i usually actually switched over sitting here because like there, I couldn't see the Zoom screen and everyone at the same time. Yep. So, like, yep. there you can see it all. Yep. And it was definitely clutch because, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, one thing I would bring up um, is that, um, yeah, over the last year of pandemic stuff, we've all morphed into every meeting format you could possibly imagine. Um, the um, As we sort of move forward, we're looking to see which way the city moves on its hybrid meeting format. I'm sure we're all still figuring it out. Um, I don't have any grand solutions, uh, you know, for it from my experience at the DRB. I'll just say that, uh, you know, having 25 people trying to public comment on Zoom and then 15 in the room on a, you know, very uh, sort of popular application, I guess that's the right word, uh, is difficult, you know, and so uh, it, we have to sort of manage that. And uh, there's definitely a format that you know, better incorporates everyone's comments and has a more productive uh, discussion than others. Um, I don't know what that is, but um, we've got, um, yeah, a few sort of, if you look at the last like five years in the DRB, uh, there's a lot going on in Montpelier right now related to housing um, and whatnot, some stuff on Northfield Street, uh, expansion, I guess, in, um, uh, you know, off Herbert Road, Isabel Circle, um, all have lots of public interest, which is great. I couldn't, as chair of the DBR, I couldn't say much more about like people showing up for meetings and voicing their opinions. Um, and uh, cause that's the point in the process where things can actually change and uh, we can actually approve housing projects in this town, which is incredibly important. <laughs> and I will just say as chair, I'll, I'll do everything I can to, you know, move forward housing projects within the bounds of our, our regulations. Um, but I guess I can't say enough that uh, whether you support a project or are against the project or nowhere in between, please show up to the meeting and institute your comments. And if you have ideas about how it can move forward better and whatnot, like that is incredibly vital in order to like actually moving this town forward. Um, because um, we don't, the last thing we want to see is great ideas come forward and them die because uh, they got, you know, hung up because no one could, you know, agree on a solution, on a common sense solution. And uh, I'll do everything I can to, you know, make sure that happens. I don't know if that's, that's a whole lot. But, um, you know, we're, we're stuck in the DRB between the uh, regulations written by another community and applicants and, a, you know, and, and a public, uh, probably no harder a task than you all have every day before you. Um, but that's, that's what we're in. And um, so just leave you with that. And also, I heard that there was an applicant, uh, Sharon Allen, uh, right here, mm -hmm. and uh, I full support for uh, having Sharon return to the DRB uh, in uh, a position that's been open for quite some time. So. Oh, okay. Go, now I understand. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> Great. Welcome. Hi. Hi. So I feel like I know just about everybody or over the long time. Um, Maybe people watching don't know you. Uh, Sharon Allen, Main Street resident, um, long-term Montpelier resident, uh, previous DRB member, Vice Chair, 2001, 2002, I think, 2003. Um, I stopped doing it because uh, we started looking at owning our own business and uh, that became very, very overwhelming and I just didn't have the extra time. Um, it, however, um, zoning regulation, weirdly, is something I really enjoy. Um, I really like seeing how uh, rules and regulations work out in real life. Um, I think it's fascinating to put those into effect. Um, my work that I did in between owning a store and being here um, was with the um, Department of Public Service, working with utility regulation. And it was some of the same kind of complexity where you had a lot of very m complex minutia about how things are supposed to work. And I worked um, doing consumer protections and making sure that those rules were really evenly applied um, and uh, was in front of the public service board a fair amount, trying to get people involved, hearing what they had to say, trying to represent consumers. So I feel like that all kind of um, matches pretty well with what the DRB does. Questions? Super, yeah, any questions? Okay, thank you so much. Thanks. Yeah.
And I don't see Jean Leon uh, in person or online with us. Um, I think those are the only uh, three folks. Um, is there a motion, Jack? I move that we go into executive session to discuss the appointment of a public officer or employee pursuant to 1 BSA section 313A3. Okay, is motion and a second. Further discussion? Um, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed. Okay, we will be right back. Is there, is there a motion to come out of executive session? So moved. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Uh, opposed. All right, so uh, is there a motion? Jack, I, go ahead. I move that we appoint uh, Robert Goodwin and Sharon Allen to uh, full positions on the Development Review Board and Jean Leon as an alternate on the Development Review Board. Okay, motion and a second. Further discussion? Uh, okay, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. And opposed? All right. Um, thank you um, for your willingness to serve. We so appreciate that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Welcome back, Sharon. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. So we are going to move on to uh, an update on leachate. Welcome. Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome back. Yes. Well, very well. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, my name's Joe Gay. Uh, I'm an engineer with Casella Way Systems, a regional engineer. Um, and oversee the permitting, environmental compliance, construction, and engineering for the landfill, in addition to the other facilities across the state of Vermont and some in New Hampshire as well. With me is uh, Sam Nikolai, the regional or the uh, vice president, sorry, uh, company's vice president for engineering uh, for Casella. So we wanted to do just a, a few things tonight uh, with you folks. Um, first and foremost is uh, we were here in November to talk a little bit about leachate, it was uh, somewhat preliminary, um, some of the discussion points around uh, the leachate being delivered to the city's wastewater plant and the concerns over PFAS, which we're gonna, we're gonna speak to tonight. We wanted to, we offered at that time to come in and give you guys updates um, uh, periodically on how things are going uh, with the process. We wanna do that. Uh, we also, I uh, want to extend the invitation um, other than Kurt and Chris uh, to come up to visit the landfill and get a tour. Um, the invitation to you all is, is still there to come up and get a tour of the site. Um, we also are happy to answer any questions about the landfill or leachate uh, tonight as well. Um, I think the first thing probably we'd like to do is give you an update on where we are with the, the PFAS uh, treatment system. So. As you can imagine, there's uh, quite a bit of permitting associated with um, such a, a facility. Um, so we have submitted our solid waste certification amendment uh, to construct a building uh, and the associated piping uh, to move the leachate from our existing storage tanks at the facility over into the building. Um, and inside the building, we would have a treatment system that would be, uh, right now we're thinking, and we'll get into this a little bit, um, specifically targeted to treat for PFAS, um, but there's a possibility that other contaminants might get treated uh, as well through that process. Uh, but our focus is PFAS at, at this time. Uh, so that solid waste certification amendment has been submitted. Uh, the agency has reviewed it. We understand that a draft certification is uh, about to be issued. Uh, so the public and, and, and we will get an opportunity to look at that draft permit. Um, and, uh, and then usually about 45 to 50 days following that, a permit is issued. Um, we have also submitted an Act 250 application because uh, where we want to put this building at the site requires a bunch of fill uh, to establish the site. Um, so we've submitted that application uh, and that permit is also uh, been issued as draft contingent upon our stormwater permit getting approved, which we expect uh, that will get approved. And then we can, we actually have a contractor on site 
it'll start moving the soil over as soon as that gets permitted so we can start building the area we want to put the building uh so that is moving uh and uh once the draft certification is issued uh we'd be able to submit our full act 250 permit for the the building itself for the leachate pretreatment uh system uh so uh so we've come a long way since november with the permitting um we have teamed with Brown and Caldwell, and we have um, a member, uh, an engineer with, with that firm here tonight uh, to help answer any questions that you guys might have. Uh, and Sanborn Head & Associates, uh, they do a lot of our landfill permitting. Um, so we have a couple of uh, consulting firms that we, we've hired to help us with uh, some of the permitting up there. Um, so any questions on where we are with that treatment system and where we are in the process. Yeah, go ahead. Just to understand, so this is um, this is a pilot project, right? So is just is the permits that you're getting and like the active 50 and stuff, do you have to go through all of this again? Or are you sizing the building that it could fit the whole thing? Or is it gonna start all over again for the Full treatment, all these permits, or are some of these <laughs> things that carry forward? Yeah, we certainly hope we are uh, positioning ourselves to be able to build a full system. Um, and so I think it's also probably important to point out too that um, probably when we were here in November, there was some discussion about a condition we were going to have in our pre treatment discharge permit that we have to bring leachate to, to the city. That permit has not been issued, but we know in that permit or we're fairly confident that there'll be a condition in that permit that requires us to do the pilot treatment system, but we're way ahead of that. The company is taking initiative to, we're not waiting for that permit. We're moving forward with the permitting. Um, and, you know, when that permit condition, uh, when that permit is issued, if that condition is like we expect it to be, we'll be way ahead of the game. Uh, so, um, so we're really not waiting for that permit. And that was something we talked about in November um, that we probably would move forward without that. And we have. Yeah, Jack, go ahead. And so, you know, what you're talking about doing, that sounds like you're moving along as fast as you can with getting the, uh, getting everything permitted. But it also sounds like even once you get, get the permits, it's going to take some time to get everything running. And so I'm thinking, well, how does your construction and work in operation timeline mesh with our yeah. July, 2023? We are pushing very hard to meet that <laughs> timeline for sure. Um, no question about it. And, um, you know, we think we can, we think we can do it. It's, um, you know, it's not going to be easy. Uh, it's a tight, it's a tight schedule. Uh, but we're one of the reasons we're here tonight is to demonstrate that we're moving forward as diligently as we can. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was we have um, partnered with a company uh, to um, to provide the treatment system, and we've sent them samples of our leachate, and uh, that leachate is being analyzed in the lab right now. We're pretty pretty confident, and Sam and Kevin that's here can speak in more detail if you have questions on the treatment system specifics uh but we're we're um we're hopeful that this pilot or the bench test that's that's being conducted currently uh will have favorable results and we can just continue to move forward uh the system is basically in a very broad sense plug and play so if we think it's going to work it's basically something that's essentially built that we just you know the permits that we're getting for the piping that's specific for the leachate delivery system that I spoke about earlier, it's basically bolting the, the pipes up, which will already be in the building and, you know, hooking the power up and going. So probably not just, that simple, but. But they're, they're just going to truck them. Once the building is done, the, the machine will just come in a truck and be set up in the building. That's correct. And, and all this will take place at the landfill. Uh, we have two large storage tanks. So, um, our, our intent is that the, the treated material ultimately that would get delivered to the city, um, you know, we have storage for, so we can, you know, um, the volumes we're talking about, we're going to need some storage. Uh, I don't know if 
this is something you can discuss. Hopefully it's not like a you know, trade secret, but could you describe how the system works? Like, is it just absorbing it? Is it reverse osmosis? Is it pyrolysis? Like, what are, what are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, I'll, I'll take a quick stab at okay. it, but I'm sure Sam's going to want to jump in. Okay. Um, so the, 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 the primary system that we're looking at is foam fractionation. Um, and uh, it's, uh, we, we understand that, um, that the foam that, that the leachate will pass through the PFAS likes to collect onto the foam where we can remove the foam and in, in essence, remove the PFAS. And the PFAS would end up um, getting um, combined with some sort of solid waste and go back in the landfill. And then, and then the leachate would be PFAS free essentially, um, probably not 100%, but pretty close. Um, and that's what would come here and be back to like the leachate that, you know, we'd, you know, well, Perhaps leachate's always had PFAS in it, but we didn't, society didn't understand kind of the situation we were in. Um, and that's all of us, by the way, not just Casella. Right. Oh, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, understood. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, just yes, yes. Sure. No, that's uh, the learning curve for us as well. So, yeah. 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 Um, great. Well, thank you. So mm -hmm. it'll effectively go back into the the landfill. So it'll, it'll just, uh, there'll be an accumulation of PFAS basically over time. Um, right. More or less. Okay. That's right. Okay. That's right. And, you know, there's other technology. We, we are looking at, um, we, we've been in contact with a company uh, as close as Sherbrooke um, that's uh, interested. So we've engaged them and we're like, hey, you know, if we can get somebody, you know, that's got a better system, you know, we're, we're all ears. And we are also are considering reverse osmosis as well. Uh, the trick with that is there's more um, waste material to deal with. Um, that are going to, it's going to be a higher concentration and a lot more of it. So that becomes tricky to get to deal with as well. So it's probably not our frontline option, mm -hmm. but it is an option that we're considering. Okay. Great. Thank you. Uh, Lauren, go ahead. Just on that point, is there, you mentioned um, that, so this is particularly good, the foam um, mm -hmm. fractionation um, at getting, because the PFAS chemicals are attracted to it. Like, does reverse osmosis get more other contaminants out and the foam would do a really good job with PFAS, but it's really focused on PFAS and doing less on other contaminants in the leachate? Yeah, I believe that's the case. Okay. okay. Sam, I don't know if you want to chime in on that. That's correct. So the, the advantage of the foam is that um, the foam is a much smaller quantity. So if we're able to get the PFAS in the foam, then you have a much smaller amount uh, to get rid of. Reverse osmosis will work well, but the residual stream is much, much larger. And so that's not quite as attractive from a PFAS removal standpoint. That makes sense. Cool. Um, other questions? Okay. Well, they, yes, go ahead. Sorry, we had uh, just one more item we wanted yeah, to, yes, to bring please. up. Yes. Um, so in May, um, the Agency of Natural Resources announced a release of potential grant funds under ARPA. So um, American Rescue uh, Plan. And this particular set of funds are targeted specifically for pretreatment of high strength wastewaters for businesses and municipalities in Vermont. Uh, and so that uh, grant proposal was released in May and the proposals are due in August of this year. Um, the uh, the RFP um, uh, addresses a number of areas, um, but it, it does allow and does focus on um, treatment of high strength waste from industrial facilities and which would include the landfill. So one of the things that um, we would like to request from um, the city is a willingness to work with us uh, on that grant program. So this would involve both us working with Kurt and Chris um, as you know, developing a, a solution but also the grant funds must be distributed through the municipality to the private businesses. So a private business can't apply directly for the grant. Um, the funds must run through a municipality. Um, and so our request tonight is that uh, you would agree to allow Kurt and Chris to work with us in the development of a proposal uh, under that program so that those grant funds potentially could be um, authorized and, and uh, potentially could be a solution. Mm -hmm. The pilot testing that we've talked about 
is going to happen regardless. So our proposal would be for the full scale system that some of these funds could be uh, obtained and, and, um, and utilized under that system. Just real quick, um, we've talked to Kurt and Chris about this, um, so they are very much in the know. Next question. <laughs> um, and uh, we would do the heavy lifting on the proposal writing um, as well. And you all are game. Yeah, I mean, they okay. did raise it with me and certainly felt to me like that was consistent with the council's priorities and strategic plan, but um, felt like you should so endorse it publicly since if you wish yeah uh jack and lauren this wouldn't uh be in competition with any other grant that we would also want to be applying for okay okay lauren i guess on that point but more specifically i mean we've we haven't talked much but i've been like i feel like montpelier should get one of these pre-treatment could get a filtration system because you know, we know that even what we're talking about here, there's still going to be more contaminants coming in as the, you know, assuming we're continuing to be the off taker of the leachate. Um, so I guess I just want to make sure we're not precluding ourselves from being able to potentially pursue that with ANR um, if we were pursuing this um, would be my main question. Um, I would also love if we are going to be partnering on it that we're looking at systems that are going to remove the maximum contamination if we're putting state dollars in that it's, you know, the, the best possible system as opposed to the most cost effective um, system. So that would be what I would hope the city uh, participating would be kind of bringing that lens to it. Any comments on that, Kurt or Bill, about is, are we precluding ourselves? I'll, I'll leave that to Kurt since he has a better handle on all the things we might be looking for. This particular grant is specific to um, pre-treatment, so it's, it's outside the plant. Well, the, our plant wouldn't be eligible to directly apply for these funds. Um, so I don't see it as, you know, um, restricting our ability to do uh, any other projects directly at the plant or because it's not, we're not eligible for this particular pot of money. Great. Thank you. Uh, Donna, go ahead. <laughs> She's leaped ahead to us having the space and the cost of that. I mean, is that another building? Is that what? Um, yeah, I mean, it would be its uh, its entire own treatment system. Um, yeah, I do expect we'd have to have another building for that. Um, I don't I have no idea what the cost would be. We haven't. Where are you going to put it in the? In the play field across the street. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah, I don't. I, I, yeah, I don't have the answers to that. We haven't, you know, gotten into any design. Um, you know, kind of have our hands full with yeah, the solids yeah. piece at the Just moment. Have you but... think about it. Okay. <laughs> I asked the question yeah. to have you think about it. Yeah, okay. We'll we will do. That. <laughs> And, and yes, go ahead. I just want to thank you. Uh, you really explained things that I understood, and I don't have the same scientific understanding of some council members. I I appreciate uh, how you well you did it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Go, Lauren, go ahead. And just on that note, I'm really excited that the progress is being made and that things are moving full steam ahead. I think when we had, you know, we're really wrestling with this issue a while ago, the hope was by continuing to partner with you all that this is exactly um, how things would be going. So I'm just grateful that it is and, you know, excited to hopefully keep getting these kinds of updates of the ongoing progress. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, yeah. Yeah, I just want to agree. I appreciate you all coming to give us this update. This is really helpful and it's, it's really encouraging to know that things are moving forward and even regardless of, uh, you know, waiting till permits are issued, et cetera. So we'll, we'll continue. We'll continue to do that as well. Super. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. So I think we are ready to move on to, uh, discussion on the water sewer budget and then the water rates. Um, so one question, I assume we should, we're going to take these one at a time, unless you would like to combine them. Well, I um, think they are related, but yes, we should do we the budget one, first. One, okay. 
unless the finance director tells me otherwise, in which case we'll <laughs> do what she says. <laughs> Perfect. We'll do that. Yes, I'm going to move. All right, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, may the folks of, of this position start um, as go over the water and sewer budgets. That budget time back in December and January, we did put forward a placeholder budget. Um, since then, this um, is a vacation represents um, where the budgets are to date um, with all of the items and then for FY23. Starting here. Kelly, you might want to be a little more on top of the microphone. Is that better? I think so. There we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so this slide uh, represents um, where uh, the composition of water sewer funds as it relates to everything else within the budget, all funds. And so you can see here um, that the water sewer pieces of the pie, the water fund is in the yellow or miracle, and the sewer is in the blue. Um, and together that represents 28.4% of the total budget. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of highlight um, this slide to give you some perspective on um, you know, what proportion of the whole these two funds are for the city's budget. Then moving along into the water fund, um, the sewer fund to follow. I've got a similar representation here in terms of a pie chart, which breaks down um, the individual components of the water fund and how the funds are used. Um, the bar chart is representative of budget to actual. Um, and you can notice um, from the bars, the dark green is where things actually came in. Um, and so, as I mentioned in the memo um, that accompanies this presentation, um, the uh, rates are up while the budget is down. And what we're trying to do here is reconcile um, revenues and how they're coming in um, to date based on consumption. Uh, the next slide that I'm going to show uh, does have all the details at a high level for this budget. If I'm moving too fast, please let me know. Um, but essentially, uh, what I've noted in the prior um, slide is that the we're really aligning. Excuse me. Okay, <laughs> that's much better. Um, that's sorry, everyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so here we go. <laughs> Um, so really what we're doing here is aligning budget to actual with trend. Um, and so much like everything with the pandemic, um, you know, the, the revenues within the water fund track to consumption and consumption is down because, you know, anecdotally, we have seen, um, you know, folks remote working, um, the state's not fully back yet. Um, and then also, you know, maybe some trips into town for businesses and the like. And so that's really where the water fund is in terms of the revenues. Um, and so we have booked that accordingly. Um, and then with the rates, um, we increased the rates by 8.2%, which is representative of um, policy and is 7.2% CPI from the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, for the Northeast region. Um, and I think that's important because it's something that we typically do tie back to for best practice. It is representative of inflation um, for our region. And the 1% is growth on the budget for projects as we've stated in the master plan. Um, and then identified below are kind of um, some high level things of what's in. Um, so for the water fund, it funds staff, operating supplies. And so I've identified, you know, some of the items that are included in that. 
category for $81,000. There um, is an investment in pipe fittings for $30,000, equipment, maintenance, repair, um, you know, some of the truck mower items, radio upgrade, um, and then investments in water equipment um, will be fog sealing uh, the parking lot for 30 k um, and then also investing in distribution and meter supplies. And then there's also a piece for other purchase services, which is um, really the contracted services for water leaks, engineering services, and cardiograph. Cardiograph um, is an asset management program that will really help us identify um, the assets that we have, track them, and then also um, you know, identify what um, needs to be replaced and when. Um, so that'll really help with capital planning. Um, and then in terms of capital improvements, we are investing 60K in the CVMC pump and then um, 20K in um, water main um, adjustments. And then I didn't put it on the slide, but I did want to highlight that there are items that are not in this budget because we did need to bring things in to um, you know, revenue where it's coming in. So. Um, the things not in was an item related to electric valves and then also additional small water line improvements. Um, and so I can take questions on each fund or I can keep going. I'm going to keep going, moving along. Um, so next up is the sewer fund. Um, this one is a little bit more interesting, I'd say, just because we've had a lot going on within this fund. Um, much like the water fund, this budget is down. Rates are up. Um, you can see in the pie chart uh, what makes up the sewer fund, what we're spending our money on. Um, and then you can see in the bar chart where we've been coming in budget to actual. And you can see that um, in FY21, you know, there was a little bit of an overage in what we had booked in the budget. And so what we're trying to do in this year in 23 is to bring things into alignment. So getting into the details here, um, this takes into account um, adjustments to revenue coming in in terms of rates. We've tied the rates to actuals rather than um, budgeted forecasts to make sure that those are realistic. We've also adjusted um, the Berlin revenue lines um, to come in with what we're actually receiving. This budget is also 8.2% per the master plan, which is 7.2% plus 1%. Um, and then getting on into some of the items that are associated with the sewer budget. And actually, let me back up for a minute here. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, something that is um, putting a little bit of pressure on the budget, and that is um, leachate and the adjustments therein. So within the revenue lines, um, that captures... Um, items associated with septage, not leachate. So leachate, actually, we didn't account for it in this budget because we have not been taking it um, due to um, certain factors at the plant. Um, and so I just want to highlight that because it is impactful. Um, and so there's, um, and we, this is more reflective of what has been happening at the plant today, not necessarily decisions um, here, but I just want to make sure that you know, there, there is a um, definitely a monetary impact to that particular item. So moving on down the line, back into sort of the detail, um, taking a look at this list, uh, it funds staff, but then also adds on a new operator position to start in April. Initially, we had budgeted this for a full year, but then took it back to align the budget with the revenues that we had coming in. Um, and then you can kind of see here just uh, big ticket items, operating supplies, um, other purchase services. You can see that we've got a grit dumpster, sludge disposal, um, contracted lab work and site work, um, professional services, the ESG operational support and engineering services related to phase one, um, and then equipment repair and maintenance, um, and then a few other items associated with purchase services, such as engineering, root control, sewer main cleaning and inspection, and then the cardiograph piece that's split within the sewer fund. Um, and then for capital funding, there is an apportionment here that goes towards the uh, equipment plan. Um, and much like with the water, there are things that are not funded in the sewer fund, um, such as funding for Cumming Street, which is about $75,000. And then also 
um, pump station um, replacement, that total project is about $500,000. The first installment would be 250. So I just want to put that out there because in future years, we'll likely bring that back forward um, because there are things that need to be done. But because of the conditions, we just don't um, have the ability to put them in FY23. So moving on to the next piece here, which has been the subject of um, some uh, inquiry as of late, um, is you know how much this is really going to to cost ratepayers in FY23. I want to note up front, as I've noted in the note on the bottom, this is um, FY23, and it's associated with the revenue downgrades. It is not associated with Phase Two or East State Street. Um, we are currently still working on those projects and assessing the impact. Um, things are extremely variable right now, and I'll get into that in a minute. Um, but as it stands right now for FY23, the average um, increase for a user would be about $9.80 per month combined. Um, and you can kind of see the math there within the sheet, and I can get into the detail. Um, but annualized, that's about $117. Um, and then just taken another way, a family of four um, with 12,000 gallons of consumption um, would be about 1032. So just kind of, you know, bearing ballpark, um, just to have an understanding of what these rates mean for folks. Um, and so just, you know, kind of getting on with the other item here um, in 24, we will be assessing the impact of the major um, projects that we have moving forward. We put them up for um, vote uh, back in March because we needed the authorization to move ahead with the projects. It doesn't necessarily mean that we are spending this money yet until we have finalized plans. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of call that out a little bit. Um, and then the other thing I will note is we did do um, an assessment and confirm the assessment that, you know, in terms of our debt service ratios, we are really close to policy. That being said, it's all dependent on what happens uh, with project costs, interest rates, um, what we get for grant funding, um, and then what happens with consumption and revenue return. So there are a lot of factors right now that we're monitoring within these two budgets. Um, and that's kind of the story across the board within all of our budgets. Um, but here in particular. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to kind of show is just um, where we stack up to other communities. Um, you know, we're highlighted here in the yellow bar. Um, we are, you know, this is based on FY22 rates. And so we are not the highest. Um, and I just wanted to highlight that. And you can see where there are others that are sort of within the realm or ballpark or are um, close to us. Um, just for comparison's sake. We also have a pretty complex system. Um, and so, you know, I, I think we do provide a good service to um, our residents. So with that, that's kind of the, the uh, presentation in total of the budget. I can get into more details. And um, Kurt is here if there are any technical components that you wanted to talk about. Um, and if not... I can stop my share and move on to the next presentation, but I think maybe maybe some folks may have questions. Okay, Jack, go ahead. Thanks, Kelly. Um, the first question I have in this uh, is that uh, I wonder if you could explain how uh, the what what the components of the readiness to serve charge are, and how uh, how it's how we determine how much of our total cost to be put into uh, readiness to serve as opposed to uh, volumetric charges. Sure, that's a, a good question. Um, so generally, and I may phone a friend also here, um, we, that's a flat fee. So everybody pays that flat fee um, for hooking on to the system, if you will. And so that's that part. And then the other part is based on um, usage. Um, and so those are the two components of the rate and how they're charged. 
Um, but for the historical perspective, I might lean on Bill a little bit for this. Um, I'll try, and we may have to dig back and get more information. But essentially, Kelly's right. The the readiness to serve is is the fixed costs of the system that allow you to have water at your tap. The bond costs, sort of basic things that don't change depending on the amount of water that you use. That it's just functional for us to have a functioning water and sewer system. Then there are variable cost chemicals and all those other things that um, that do vary with, with use. So people pay for those by their actual use. So it's um, you know it's not a, it's not perfectly lined up that way. But the council spent oh, a number of years ago now. Um, sometime looking at the rates and trying to figure out that particularly the bond costs and those kind of things. I wanted to be sure that they, we could cover those even if people were reducing their, their rate use. Okay. So it's actually, it, it, it they're all, they're all cost-based and the, uh, and the usage rates are as much as possible based on incremental cost of service. Correct. Okay. Thanks. Right. Other questions from council, and then we'll get to your question, uh, Vicki. Any other questions? Uh, okay, uh, Vicki and Lynn, go ahead. Um, I beg of you, I can't afford any more increases. Um, I mean, people like me, single, elderly, or older women on very fixed income, I live on Medicare, I mean, I live on Social Security. We just can't can't afford any of these increases. I mean, it's bad enough going to the grocery store, um, the gas station. It just, it can't, it's not sustainable. We just can't do it. Thank you, Vicki. Um, thoughts or comments? on the budget. Okay. Yeah, um, I just wanna acknowledge that that is um, really, it's really hard, um, but um, it's kind of, it, I, I'm not sure that I see any good alternatives at the moment, um, but open to talking about stuff in the future. Um, so, is there so if folks are okay with this budget, we should have a, a motion. Um, is there a motion? Uh, Connor, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll move to approve the rates and just now note well, that. So uh, this is the budget, the rates are next. Oh, I, I'm sorry, the budget. Yeah, okay, yeah. that's all right. Uh, but yeah, I would note, I, you know, we do know this is a hardship for some folks there. Uh, but what this funds are very essential services here, and we have to pay for it one way or the other. Um, so this is the most logical way to do it. So it's a motion to approve the budget. Is there a, second. okay, motion in a second. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, and so now we're gonna move on to the rates. Oh, great. Hey, this will be quick, I promise. Okay. Um, so. <clears throat> Excellent. Thank you. Um, so uh, this is, and it's FY23. I'm just going to get rid of the front side there. Um, as they pulled this from last year. Um, and so this is the, the rate history to support the budget um, within the revenue lines that we just discussed. Um, and so as you can see here, um, we're up by 8.2%. Um, the thing that I wanted to note um, is looking at this and comparing it for a trend over five years and then comparing that to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, Labor Statistics is at about four, well, so this 
considering the average over five years based on this sheet here, we're at about 4.6% increase. Um, and if you look at the same period of time uh, for CPI through Bureau of Labor Statistics, they're at about 4.02. So for that same five-year period, we're very close to what the regional um, increase should be based on um, those inflationary costs. Um, and so then just going into the details um, provided within the resolution and the increases, there are some items here that are adjusted um, a little bit differently than the 8.2%. Um, these are some of the flat fees um, that are, are that are being adjusted. Um, and so I just wanted to call those out here. They're in the resolution. Um, but what we just discussed and what was on the historical sheet are um, the metered rates. And then I just wanted to highlight these based on the resolution that um, hopefully you'll take action on in short order here. Um, and then this is just a... Uh, Another summary of what we talked about in terms of the impact uh, to consumers, $9.80 uh, per uh, both uh, water and sewer rates. And then uh, lastly, just, just to highlight and summarize where we're at, um, recommended increase um, for the rates is 8.2% uh, for the metered rates. Um, this would be effective for FY23. It's important to note that the billing period ends September 30th and the due date is December 15th. Um, we have been trying to move these budgets forward to align with the fiscal year so that people um, can, you know, maybe change their usage um, once the rates take effect. So they'll see that in their first bill. Um, and then just to highlight what this really covers, um, it addresses the revenue downgrades, funds, operational expenses, and stabilizes funding for future years. Um, we're gonna be taking a really close look at the revenues and um, seeing what we find as we go forward. Um, but for now, this is what it is. And so I hope that you'll approve um, the rates as they are and the resolution um, that has been presented in the packet. Okay, um, Jack. Oh, and then Carrie, go ahead. I remember it must have been about 20 years ago that we went through, and I know that you weren't here then, but I, we went through a process where uh, a lot of people in the city, a lot of the residential accounts were flat rate accounts. And I thought that everybody was required to move to, uh, to metered accounts and now I still see that we still got a lot of people on flat rate accounts, and I wonder if we could, uh, if I could understand that. So um, I'm I'm not sure, and we can certainly provide the data if you'd like in terms of the number of accounts that are flat rate accounts. A lot of them are metered accounts, um, and the majority of them are, um, but we still do have some that you know for which there is a flat rate. Yeah, Council Member McCullough is right that we did require everyone. So I, I, at one point, I thought we were down to like one flat rate account. So I don't know why somebody would be, but I, I haven't paid close attention to it. So we, we can get that information and get back Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. Thanks. Okay. Oh, here we go. Uh, <laughs> City Engineer. Um, so uh, some of, a lot of these are at the Berlin accounts. There's some trailer parks out there. And due to freezing issues, um, a lot of times with uh, mobile homes, it's difficult to keep those from freezing. So they go on a flat rate. The, the rate is structured to be higher than metered. So it's structured um, to encourage folks to get meters in their buildings and those that are not pay more. Okay, so, thanks. Yeah. Anything further? Go ahead. The other thing that, uh, I don't know if tonight is the night and this is the time to do it, but uh, there's been a lot of public commentary on the quality of the water and all that stuff, which I actually do not share those concerns. Uh, I've toured the, uh, toured the water plant, and I agree with the person who, who wrote at the, to Front Porch Forum that you could literally eat off the floor at, uh, <clears throat> at our water plant. But because there's been so much public concern, either tonight or at some point, I, we should have a conversation about that.
thoughts. Yes, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question about um, the rate increase, and um, you had you had referenced it as going up according to policy and tied to consumer price index and inflation. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about what that policy is, or actually, let me back up. The impression I'm getting from that is that there's kind of a formula or there's a process set in policy and that that is what is used every year to set the rate. So first, is that right? And then second, can you explain a little bit more about how it works and why it is so much higher this year than it has been in recent years uh, on an individual year basis? Sure. Um, so I I'll start and Bill will jump in likely. Um, <laughs> I hope. Um, but uh, so, yes, I mean, so the the rate is based on CPI and that's inflation. And so that's based on what the economic conditions are. And it is quite a bit higher than it has been in years past. And it's also based on prior year past practice for the master plan. And so that's something that the council has approved and authorized. Um, and so that's the policy that I'm referencing in terms of using that as the formula in which we would evaluate the rates and how much we would increase them by. Um, and so that's how I arrived there. Um, I hope that answers your question. Right. So, so just to amplify a little bit, the master plan she's referring to about, again, I lose track of the number of years, but recognizing we had aging infrastructure and that we couldn't, uh, we couldn't just pay to fix it all at once that we actually i think laid out a 50-year plan which included some of these plant upgrades and some of these major streets and looked at ways to finance that including existing debt dropping off in future years and the the decision at the time was at least until we got things more stabilized was to adjust rates by inflation plus one percent to sort of catch up on the infrastructure so that's been what we followed it's i think what's different this year is you know, last year, I think it was, what, 1.7 plus one or something, and this year it's mm -hmm. 7.2 plus one. So it's we've only proposed the same policy that the council's adopted, obviously, if, and it matches the budget, which, you know, and then we're, it's amplified because our use is down. So, you know, you think about the national lives of the world and the state buildings and all those things that are big water users that have been closed or had low occupancy, and so our we, we, we're not even seeing the same water usage and revenue as past. So we're just trying to, we, we need to deliver the clean water and sewage treatment and everything to citizens. So try, you know, I, I appreciate what Vicki said, she's right, but you know, the cost to, to do these systems are also up uh, because they're relying on fuel and, and inflationary factors. So it's in order to, to do what we need to do, it's, it's a struggle. Anything to follow up on that? Oh, just that I uh, I appreciate that. Thank you. That's what it sounded like. Um, and I think it's just important to really understand that 8.2% is a huge jump. And a lot of people are going to feel that. I'm going to feel that. Um, but that it it's not arbitrary, that it comes from somewhere, that it's connected to our needs and our use. And thank you for explaining that, both you, Kelly, and Bill. And the other thing that I might just add for a little bit of clarity there, too, um, is that we did look for the past five years, just to see, you know, because it is a big spike to kind of, you know, maybe see what the smoothing out of that number would look like if you look, took it on five years rather than just the one. And so we are on point within our historical rates at about, you know, 4% or so um, and tracking accordingly. But still, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, it's a lot. Uh, Jennifer and then Jack. It seems like an apropos time for me to get on my indigenous soapbox. <laughs> Um, water, we can't live without it. Nothing on this planet can live without it. And we are in a crisis when it comes to having clean, healthy water on this planet. Um, and so when we get in these positions, um, learning how to manage your use, and this is such a wild thing to be saying in 2022, but it's the reality that we're in, um, it's something that we're all going to have to do because we are running out of water. It is a precious commodity. And I don't think enough people understand how dire the situation is. And we're going to continue to have these inflations. We're going to continue to have to pay extra for real basic things because of what we're doing with our water. And um, 
we're not protecting it and we need to protect our water. And I can't exp- like, there's, there's not enough words that I can come up with on how important this is. Um, and it may seem a little weird that I'm getting emotional about water, but um, I'm a water protector that I am charged with that by my tribe, by my people. And I know that this inflation is going to affect everybody. It's, I mean, everybody is going to feel it, but it's going to continue unless we learn how to use less, unless we learn how to consume less, unless we learn how to let our lawns do what they're going to do, um, figure out ways to shower shorter. I know it's, it's, it's crazy notion, but it's doable. And it's something that we're going to have to move into because there is no, there's no other options. We're, once the fresh water is gone, the fresh water is gone. And um, yeah, I'm sorry. That's just, it's water is, is a huge thing. And uh, I just, I know this is going to be a lot and hard for everybody, but I feel like this is a really good time to start buckling down and thinking about the future and thinking about the young people that live on this planet right now that um, are going to have even bigger struggles when it comes to water and affording water. So um Tightening the belt. I, I can't believe I'm even saying that, but um, trying to figure out ways to tighten the belt so that you can afford your water and so that there's water left um, for the future generation. So that's all. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, Jack, go ahead. I, uh, one, one thing that is, might be of interest to some of the people, uh, and I agree that it's a, it's a big hit at one time, but on the other hand, if if you look at the uh, the table that was provided of the historical rates, it's it's really pretty amazing because um, there were years like from 1995 to 2000, there was a zero percent increase, and then it went way up. And there were years where multiple occasions where there were years of zero percent increase a couple of years in a row, and and then people got hit with a big increase, and they didn't like that because people didn't people nobody likes getting hit with a big increase and i think the the policy of having steady consistent uh, increases was really the way to go people are obviously are getting hit when we have a, a big increase in one year but it is because it's reflective of uh, the rate of inflation yeah thank you i uh, don well as a single household person, I am zapped with a minimum of water and sewage, and I cannot use that much water. So unfortunately, probably Vicky's in the same boat. She gets charged more water than she begins to use. So it is rough. I would suggest thinking about house sharing, Vicki, reduce your costs, because it really is hard to maintain a household by yourself. So. It makes me wonder if there is a structure out there that where the the minimum um charges you know the minimum gallons is less than um the current one does that make sense mm-hmm. i mean i, I realize we're pro- probably not prepared to do that tonight <laughs> and i'm not suggesting that right now but i i think that's yeah maybe worth looking into especially if people are trying to conserve and the num- it would be interesting actually to see because I mean, uh, we would know if the usage was significantly less based on the meters, right? So it'd be interesting to know if people's if, like how how many meters out there are using significantly less than the minimum charge. Yeah, y- yeah, just supporting the idea that it <clears throat> should be. Um, people should be incentivized to use less water based on how much they're paying. And so right now it's hard to make a dent because of the way the billing is for various reasons. Mm -hmm. You can reduce your water usage a bit and still not notice any difference in your bill. Mm -hmm. Um, And so, uh, you know, I understand it's a complex system, but I think it's worth looking at to try to address that. Just putting out the radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, Vicki, Vicki and Lane, go ahead. Oh, I, you are muted. Uh, 
Uh, we still cannot hear you. you. Oh, there you because go. Because you didn't unmute me. You didn't allow me to. Oh, yeah, at the risk of at the risk of getting myself uh, arrested, like Stephen, it is more than hard. This is more than hard. Saying it's hard and you realize it's hard is like saying, "Oh yes, we need thoughts and prayers at the next school shooting." Um. So. It, it, this is more than hard. And the way you're billing, you can't tell whether or not, unless you guys start billing for actual water gallons used instead of to the nearest thousand, there's no way that you know what you're doing. There's no way you know whether you're conserving. I'm a single person. I take one shower a day. I wash my dishes. I don't have a dishwasher. I do my... I. I um, drink the water, unlike many people who complain about it, I do drink it. I wash my clothes. But as much as I have tried to conserve and have tried to find every possible leak that I might have in my house, it doesn't make a damn bit of difference in the bill because I still get, and I can go back 28 years, 5,000, 6,000, 7,000, bouncing from 7,000 to 6,000, 7,000 to 6,000. It's like you don't even read my meter. So don't tell me. And I'm not, I don't want to continue to subsidize big employers who have closed up and are making lots of money because their people are now working from home and they're not using as much water. So me. The single people on Social Security, we're paying the bill for that. Now, I don't want to hear how hard you agree it might be. This is more than hard. If it was just this increase, that might be something. But it's five bucks a gallon for gas. It's six bucks a gallon for heating oil. It's twice I have to have a window replaced in my house because the thing is rotting out twice or three times the cost. I don't care what it says. You can send the cops after me. Three times or twice the cost of what it was before. So, you know, if you got to cut some people's salaries, do it. I don't give a shit. But this is more than hard. Don't keep telling me thoughts and prayers are with the homeowners because it just this falls on deaf ears and to jennifer's point i am a vermonter i am a native vermonter my ancestors were here in the 1600s so yes i i guess yours probably were here first but i grew up with the vermont the vermont ideal and and devotion to the land and the water and everything so don't tell me that your tribe is any different than my tribe because my tribe had a tremendous appreciation for water, sea, land, sky, trees, forest. Just don't tell me all of that. It's going to be hard. You're just saying it th thoughts and prayers for the next 20 kids that get shot. And God forbid they happen in our country, our city. Okay. Would you like to say anything? If not, that's fine. No, um, totally yeah. Um, um, so I'm just going to make a comment. Um, thank you, Vicki, for um, sharing your um, your opinions. I would uh, ask that uh, we consider uh, with more respect uh, the uh, native perspective um so but otherwise thank you um and i am very interested in figuring out how we can uh make conservation efforts show up for folks and feel um like they're uh, actually affecting their um their bills so uh perhaps a discussion for another time um unless folks want to talk about that now. Um, 
otherwise, other thoughts or comments? Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. Carl. I'm just going to say, Vicki, I, you know, I, I'd ask you to be a little more sensitive in the future with some of these comments. I think that was very offensive. Uh, talking about indigenous people and comparing the hardships you face on your water bill to a school shooting with the thoughts and prayers. It's completely out of order, Vicki. It's... Yeah. Other thoughts? Yes, Lauren, go ahead. I just want to echo that. And I wanted to thank Jennifer for her statement. I appreciate it and value her perspective and hope it is respected and yeah. really yeah that's it. i agree okay it's 8 30 and we're going to take a break all right thanks um we'll vote later we'll vote we're going to take a break right now thank you oh. Oh. Motion for the resolution. you do I make the motion that we pass the resolution on the water and sewer rates. Second. Okay, further discussion? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jack, go ahead. I think the point is correct that uh, this, is, this is a big increase for people and people will, will feel it, but I just think we have no choice but to pay the cost of uh, operating our water and sewer system and supplying uh, healthful, uh, potable water to the uh, to the customers. And so I support the uh, proposed rates. Okay, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, uh, great, thank you. Uh, all right, so we are, uh, up to an update on the district heat plant. Welcome. Yeah. Kind of wild. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so I did not prepare a PowerPoint. That's okay. A conversation. Oops. Is that working better? Stay closer. Okay. All right. So. No, you really need to pull it closer to yourself. Closer. So it, yeah. Like that. All right. Is that better? Yes. yes. Okay. That's better was, yes. All right. We have to stay in front of you. That's all. Yes. Okay. Um, so I think you all know who I am. I'm the public works director. And one of my responsibilities is to oversee the dis uh, city's district heat program. Um, but I also want to acknowledge that we have a core team that includes both the public works deputy director, Kurt Modica, and finance director Kelly Murphy, and we collectively engage with other city staff who bring specific expertise to the program as we need it to um, be beneficial to our participants. Um, so this evening I'm going to provide an overview of the program, the benefits District Heat brings to both users and our community, recent beneficial modifications that have been undertaken and potential new opportunities that are being explored. So first, a brief introduction, especially for those who may be um, joining us um, and um, some folks who may not really understand um, what the history of District Heat is. Um, so presently, Montpelier's district heat program is one of 660 district heat energy systems currently operating in the United States. Um, I was a bit surprised that there were that many of them out there. <laughs> so that's good news. Um, and there's an organization called the U.S. District Energy Services or Organization, and it has indicated that there is continued growth in district heating programs nationwide at this point in time, which I think speaks to um, our um, ability to manage this program going forward, but also to the innovation that created it originally. Um, district heating pro uh, provides communities 
with energy related advantages when compared to other forms of heating. And district heat also provides environmental benefits to both participants and their communities when compared with more traditional fossil fuel heating systems. So overview, um, 1.3% of all commercial buildings in the United States are currently using district heating system networks for seasonal heating. And I was surprised by that um, data. Um, recent data identifies Montpelier's district heat program as one of 660 systems in the United States. Users as participants in district heat program, users, I'm sorry, as they are known in district heat programs, benefit from energy efficiencies, security for their businesses and organizations, and experience resiliencies that are inherently beneficial from this type of energy system. Since its inception, our district heat program has provided local businesses, participants, local business participants, the opportunity to manage their respective heating systems in an environmentally friendly manner that is consistent with the city's ongoing commitment to engage in sound environmental practices and clean renewable energy. District Heat Montpelier was originally developed by the city of Montpelier in conjunction with the state of Vermont to provide local renewable, reliable, and effective heating solutions to Montpelier and its local businesses. Presently, we have 18 buildings in downtown Montpelier participating in district heat, and the city continues to pursue potential opportunities to generate capacity for additional users. To date, Montpelier's system has been operating for eight years, and the city's district heating system allows customers participating in this program to connect to customers' building heating system to their own building heating systems to the district heating system. The city agrees to continuously provide thermal energy to customers sufficient to satisfy the customer's individual capacity needs. And those situations are identified during user contracts. I'm sorry, I have a slight cold and my lips are sticking together. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, customers of District Heat Montpelier are signed onto 20 year contracts for the supply of thermal energy to their buildings. And the mission of the program was clearly established and accepted by all the participants as providing renewable, local, affordable heat to the capital city's historic downtown and adjacent neighborhoods. Its objectives are the following, reduce the demand for and use of fossil fuels in the city, provide stable thermal energy rates, increase the energy efficiency of buildings connected to District Heat Montpelier, and grow District Heat Montpelier to reduce heating costs, increase the efficiency for all users, and increase the util utilization of renewable energy in our community. There are a variety of benefits to users. Sorry, there are a variety of benefits to users and the energy and they include energy efficiency, security and resilience. So district heat systems use steam distribution to provide thermal energy for space heating, hot water needs um, of buildings connected to systems like our own city offices. Put simply, District Heat is a network of underground pipes that deliver hot water to or steam. Oh. I think the question was, were you going to read all five pages of the report? Oh, I, I was planning on doing that. Well, did, did you all get a chance to read this um, document? Yes. Yeah, so we've oh, read I'm it. Oh, I'm sorry. I, it's I, okay. I'm sorry. No worries. All right. Given that, um, is there anything uh, additionally that you want to add? 
Um, so you, we've also gotten to the, you've also read the part of the new options for programming that we may be we, able why to you have. Why focus so. on those highlights? The, okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Sort of what's going on now? That. that would be great. I didn't realize I haven't been here presenting okay. in such a long it's time. Okay. I, I just didn't think about the fact that you all had this. We have it. It's okay. So yeah, but those, no, no worries. No. Um, so let's see. So Montpelier is, is looking for grant opportunities and other opportunities um, for the district heat system. And one of those applications um, under consideration is a snow melt system. Um, the project's intended to maximize snow removal, reduce travel time and distance for winter operations, result in energy savings um, for us, and we have the current infrastructure to manage that process. There's, um, there are also um, potential safety issues for residents that come from that when snowfall and cleanup has been delayed during a particular storm. Um, added overtime for collection and trekking is diminished. Um, potential accidents as residents attempt to maneuver around heavy equipment or park vehicles with snow are also diminished so that there is um, a direct um, benefit to the larger community and not just to the users of the district heat system. Um, the second project that's under consideration is the downtown snow um, effort um, I am sorry. Can I just get my um? I sure. I have a bowl. That's fine. Whatever you need, it's all good. So there are air emissions that would be achieved by using renewable energy for heating from the snow melt program. And um, significant benefits in creating a renewable resource for us to manage um, as an addition to our current operations. We would reduce trucking. Um, there would be lower staff time. We could um, repurpose um, hours of staff who currently have to um, pick up and plow and move things long distances. Um, it would improve water quality through treatment at the wastewater plant and um, just in general reduce emissions throughout the whole city. Um, The, um, one of the other things that we've done this year, um, and I want to um, mention it, is our contacting Evergreen Energy, in, um, a leader in district heat programming. Um, we um, asked them to evaluate our current system and to give us a response so that we knew um, where we stood in regards to our optimal situation. Um, we got a very good report back from them. There were no um, inconsistencies or um, suggestions that we needed to make dramatic or non-dramatic changes. Um, and Can so- just, just clarify, just so people are clear, that, that was with regard to our rate setting and how we set capacity rates. There were some questions, you know, because we had done a change this past year. So, uh, we are hoping to have them look at our overall operations, but but for now there were questions: Did we use the proper methodology for rate setting? And they they reviewed and said, "Yes, you did the industry standard and match it." So I think that was important for our customers to understand that we were doing things correctly. So sorry to interrupt, but no, that's okay. That was a good clarification. Um, um, hang on one second, Donna. Go ahead. So, are you planning to have them come back and do the whole system? They're, they're, yes, but they're also going to do the rate 
structure again this year. What do you what do you mean? Like they're gonna do like so, they're gonna look at it again or they're gonna help set it or yeah, they're gonna help set it this year. Okay. So what if, if I may. Yep, go ahead, please. <laughs> we had not really done an overhaul of you know, looking at the capacity rates. So so much like we just talked about water and sewer, there's a capacity rate that you pay for sort of how much you're expected to use and then your actual heat rate. And the capacities were initially set based on estimated capacity. So now we have some history. So this past year, we reset them based on the actual history, the actual usage of the prior year. That caused some people to go up, some people to go down. And obviously for those, particularly those that went up, there was a lot of concern, understandably. And one of the questions was, um, uh, you know, did you do it right? And we thought it was a fair question, given the fact that we hadn't really recalibrated it before. So we asked Evergreen, an outside entity, to to look at our work. And they said, yes, you did it right. And then so what we committed to the customers was we would do it for three straight years to, to get a, a, a recalibration uh, just to speak just to get a sense of people's use patterns. And, you know, some of the users have made uh, improvements to their systems, you know, become more efficient. So they should see a drop. Uh, so, so does that mean they, they'll be doing it again this year and then next year, and then we'll probably go back to like an every three year cycle once okay. we've seen some use pattern. Got you. So like the, the history that the capacity rate is based on will reset every year for three years. Right. And then we'll, okay. then we'll, and then after that, after that, we'll, then okay. we should see patterns. Okay. People, by then we'll have made enough changes to their building. So it should be settled. Okay. That is helpful. Yeah. Our goal is to get exactly as possible. Right. Right. Okay. So I'm not sure that I have a lot more information to explain since you've already Read okay. what that's in your okay. packets. Um, Maybe we can just go to questions. Go ahead, Donna. Yeah. Well, one of my questions is whenever we talk about expansion, I think about the cost in whatever additional digging we have to do to allow that expansion. I mean, is that anywhere been thought out? So, so the expansion that we're looking at is what can be done along the existing route. So obviously, if we were to expand by adding new lines, then that's a whole new capital cost and capacity that would have to be, you know, caught, we have to do cost benefit to see whether it was worth doing. The idea is to find users um, that are on the existing loop that it may just be a connection. And are there ways that we can help subsidize the cost of connections? And there are some grant funds to talk about that. I'm actually meeting with Senator Perchelik in his day job capacity next week to to talk about some of those opportunities. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of, it's sort of like we have this capacity that we paid for. So the more users you can, everyone's, right, right. everyone's cost goes down. It's kind of a cooperative type thing. So we're one of the best ways to help bring everyone's rates down is to have more users. One of the users would be our own snowmelt system, which would, we would, we, the city would be paying for, but that would be a revenue that would help offset other people's um, costs. And that actually is one of the things that we applied for with the Northern Borders grant, along with studying the feasibility of other expansion. We're, we've been talking to some other potential customers and part of that Northern Borders grant, if we were to get it, would be to design that and see if that could work. So, yeah, I, I must have missed it. So when the, the existing piping was laid, Every potential business has a connection already dug. No. We'd have to dig from where nope. it is to them. No. So, so yes, there would be connections from the main line to the businesses would okay. need to be done. Some, depending on the side of the road that, that the main line is on, you know, some are further than others. There was, there was only one business that was um, co contemplating coming on that hasn't yet that, that because it was so close proximity to their building and they were actively interested they agreed and we agreed to put a loop into their building just in case so there's only one potential customer that has a loop that isn't a customer okay. but there are others that are approximate and jack go ahead thanks donna a couple of questions one is that i i think i recall some dispute between the state and the city about 
how much capacity we have to add customers and uh and so do we know how much capacity there is and and do we have the ability to uh to add customers or i i would guess that this is a good year to be uh talking to this this business that that has the loop to say well you know if you were paying for wood chips instead of for uh fuel oil you'd probably be happier uh, than you are now but so what the the first question i have is uh do we have people that we could uh, add to the system uh, within our capacity and then the other thing is if you could just explain a little bit more about how the uh how the snowmelt system would actually work what it, what is it is and how it would work sure um so we do have um potentially four more interested parties um that we could bring on we have capacity to handle that um and um something kurt and i will be looking into um as we move forward um in terms of the snow melt system um the um I'm sorry, I'm just trying to find my um while you're, while you're pulling that together, I can, yep. I can give you okay. Answers. So I also uh, so with regard to the issue with the state as far as capacity, there's two things. Actually, one piece of good news is the, is that the energy savings that some of the larger customers made has freed up capacity on its own. Hmm. So that so not only did it help them and make our whole overall system, but now it creates capacity for, for more people to come on. So that's good. Um, the other thing, I, I have had a couple of conversations with the current commissioner of BGS, and they are open to sort of talking about that issue. I think it was um, I don't know, a misunderstanding, or I think it was just a question of how things were, were looked at, you know, so they're, they're willing to have a conversation. We're trying to set up a meeting with them, I think, in the next week or so to talk. We've got to go through rate stuff with them and um, so the, the door is open a little bit to have, have a conversation about what works. I think, you know, we have technically purchased up to, you know, what, what we were supposed to purchase. The issue is, can we, can we buy more in the future? Mm -hmm. too? And, you know, from their perspective, the, and the contract clear, it says we can buy it if it's available. And I think their perspective was, we really need that extra capacity for backup in case, you know, we can't have the whole state system go down and because there's two two boilers. They need to put in a third boiler to really explain it being. So I think their from their perspective is if one goes down, we need the second one. So we couldn't sell any more capacity because that's all it could handle. And that's not an unreasonable position. So the question is how like, you know, what are the what's the risk? What's the likelihood? What's the management? What what would it cost? So we're gonna have that conversation and, and maybe we can resolve that. So I don't think wasn't so much about a dispute as much as it was trying to understand where everyone was coming from. Thanks. Yeah. Um, I see a hand up from Alyssa Shuren. Go ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, and thanks for the the presentation, um, Donna and Bill, it's nice to see you both again. Um, I was actually here for the police review committee work that we're going to be doing next, but it's such an interesting topic, District Heat, that I thought I would just um, speak on this as well. Uh, as I think most folks know, I'm on the vestry at Christ Church in Montpelier, which is on the District Heat system. Um, and we have had some very productive meetings with, um, with Bill and Donna and city staff as we've been making improvements over the last year uh, to make sure that our rates go down because we saw a really big jump um, once the rates were redone. I just have one remaining question that I don't think has been answered, and, and maybe you'll be getting to this over the summer, but um, you know, you set the rates based on the first peak. Um, so rates are set on peaks. I, folks probably know that. And the highest peak um, is how rates were set. But then the the company that you hired also looked at the second peak, and which is 
which is much um, closer to reality uh, in a more consistent way, at least for Christchurch. Like if you, the, just to give people a sense between the first peak and the second peak, it was a 43% drop. So that's a major usage drop. And then the overall allocation of the church for the whole system dropped 3.1%. So I just think it's worth thinking as you're setting the rates on like, do you do it on the highest peak? Do you do it on the second? Do you do it based on an average? Like what is the most equitable way to do this? Um, I don't think it's going to be a problem for us in the future because we have so many conservation method, like mechanisms we've put on our system at this point that I don't think we're going to be experiencing peaks in the same way we have in the past, but it is, um, I think it is a broader question for all entities on the system. Do you know how you'll be setting the rates? If it will be based on that first peak or if it will be based on a second peak or the average. So I, I, I'll, I'll defer to the real expertise, probably to Kurt, if if necessary. But I, I think we'll be setting them as per what the contract says, which, which I think is on the peak. But I'd have to look at it. I don't have it in front of me, um, so I, I I'm not trying to hedge. I just don't know for sure the answer. Um, I do know that our our capacity with the state is based on the high peak, so that's what we get charged for. So we've based our fees off of that so we'd have to look at that we're, we're like i said we'll be talking to them soon so i, I that's a, that's as good a non-answer as i can give you a list thank you um all right any other questions uh or kurt do you want, want to add something sure i'll add a little bit to that um so the peak is based on a 15 minute rolling average and, you know, I think maybe what Alyssa is referring to is um, when the system comes on, some customers experience the high peak because, you know, the, you're going from a cold heating system to a warm system and there's a big change there. Um, we, I am planning to recommend to our consultant that we do not count the very first startup peak, but, um, but I believe per contract, we still have to, like Bill said, stick with the, the high 15 minute average omitting startup. And but that um, is going to be relooked at every what, year. What for, the, how that's measured and how it's yeah. allocated, but the the rate structure system is set okay. by contract. So okay. our, it's our contract okay. with the state and the user, so we require major amendments to make big changes. Okay. Okay. Not to say we wouldn't consider it if it was the right thing to do, but we just it's not like we can just change it by vote of the council. Right. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, other questions or comments? We didn't get your second question. Right. Jack, go ahead. What is what is the snow melt thing? What what how, how do you do it? What's the right? Is it you just shovel all the snow into a tank and heat run, heat it up or what? <laughs> it's sort of the way <laughs> it's uh... on any pictures. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so they make systems for parking garages and we actually looked at them when we were exploring the parking garage that are fueled from oil or propane, which obviously is not consistent with council goals. Um this is fairly unique. There's not I'm not aware of any that um that are built from a district heat system. So we would be sort of creating the design, but the idea is a large three-sided concrete bunker with hot water pipes poured into the concrete um, that would connect to our district heating system with a heat exchanger, just like a customer building would. Um, we would turn it on, you know, maybe an hour or two before snow removal operations. Our snow removal would be just like it is now. We would um, go out with dump trucks and load snow uh, from along the curb line into trucks and then drive it over to the snow melt system, which would be back in this parking lot here and dump dump the truck into this bin. And so it'd be re recessed into the ground so that um, you'd have some depth there to fill with snow and allow it to melt. Um, from there, we'd have a screen on it. So it would take the trash out and then it would be connected to the collection system, the sewer collection system, so that we could treat all the, the salts and everything um, at the plant. Thanks. Hmm. 
So it would effectively just eliminate large snow banks. Is that so? Right. So we do that now, right? We we eliminate the snow banks, but we bring it, we truck it all the way up to the stump dump, every bit of snow that we take out of the downtown. Yeah. And so there's all that trucking, right. the staff time it takes to get there, the emissions from the trucks. Um, and then we have a salt issue from the runoff at the stump dump because there's no treatment in place. So we're solving a lot right. of environmental benefits, saving staff time, okay, saving gas. I mean, there's cost savings there. That is fascinating. Okay, cool. Uh, Thank you. One caveat. Um, I'm not 100% sure that our piping in this area is big enough to support to the volume needed. Uh, you need a lot of BTUs to melt the snow, right? So, mm -hmm. And the piping here was designed for three buildings. So we part of our grant is to, um, you know, the first step is to evaluate the capacity of the system to make sure that we can actually make this work. So I don't want to get everybody's hopes up too much. It's a great concept, but we haven't done the engineering to verify that it's feasible here. And then would uh, would the sewer plant charge the Department of Public Works for the volume of whatever goes from the snow melt facility to the sewer plant? <clears throat> I think that's a, a valid question. I think we would be an unmetered account. Um, but yeah, I think um, that there should be some sort of Adjustment from the general fund to the sewer fund to cover that cost. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Right. Yeah. Yep. Fair question. Great. Any other uh, questions for now? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Donna. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Right. It's helpful to have uh, this this update. Yeah. Well. I'm glad you all read it. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. And I'm sorry. I um. Oh, it's okay. Going on. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much. All right, and I think we are ready to move on to um, uh, this uh, police review committee uh, item about officer recruitment. Um, oh. so. Uh, welcome, Chief Pete. Yeah. And um, also, I know we have uh, Melissa Sharon on from the Police Review Committee, and we have there were counselors also on that committee, but I don't see anyone else on with us digitally um, from that group. Just wanted to, to make sure. Okay. So we'll we'll start with you, uh, Chief, and then. Um, um, Alyssa, if you have anything you want to add, uh, we'll do that, and then we'll we'll talk about it. Okay. Okay. Yes, go ahead. Uh, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the City Council, City Manager, and Assistant City Manager. Uh, I'm Brian Pete with the Montpelier Police Department, and today uh, I'd like to present to the council um, the city's uh, or our response related to the Police Review Committee's or the PRC's recommendation regarding uh, minimum hiring requirements. Uh, these are the topics I'd like to to discuss, uh, which are what exactly the PRC's hiring recommendations were, uh, what MPD's position is, um, what MPD's current hiring practices are, um, as well as what our hiring process is, and then to take the opportunity to discuss with the council or to inform the council regarding uh, national and statewide trends and obstacles in attracting applicants and retaining officers. Uh, and then finally, uh, give a, a summarization of what MPD's current staff numbers and fu future strategic projections are. I I'd like to begin this again by recognizing the, the time, the patience, and the commitment that the PRC has done. This is this is good stuff, and and it's and and we honestly and sincerely appreciate all the effort that they that they put into this, and it's done in a way to make sure that this department continues on with the cultures and the values that this community wants from us. It's a partnership. It wasn't an adversarial thing, and we know and we acknowledge that. And so I just want to make sure I I, I put that out there. Um, so what, what the recommendations of the PRC were uh, to quote, were looking at uh, minimum requirements to 
do revisions for the minimum requirements for hiring to include a minimum of one year post-secondary education uh, with preference for an associate's degree uh, or equivalent life and or internship experience, and then uh, a demonstrated commitment to volunteer or paid community service. Again, this is done with a spirit of how do we find, this is something every law enforcement agency across the country is struggling with. How do we find the right people to do a job that has so many responsibilities associated with it? And, and this is a concern for everybody. So I applaud them for, tr for, for working to tackle something that's elusive to all of us still. Um, and, and I'll get into that. And, and so, so with that saying, I, I, I believe there's no greater demonstration to the commitment of community service, but then to volunteer for community service, to be, to go for an elected office, to work as uh, a, a member of a city staff or a municipality for the state is to donate your time because we sure as heck, nobody's getting rich off doing this work. And it's often very thankless. So, so, so our, so, so, so that's, that's my particular um, point on that one. I, I, with, with the position of for the Montpelier Police Department, um, I believe that this requirement is going to be an additional barrier um, as we as a department are already struggling in attracting and, uh, and retaining uh, uh, applicants um, that uh, my, my uh, recommendation is to maintain current hiring standards and practices uh, as they are centered around state requirements. Uh, the state had put out, I believe I have it in, in, in an attached packet, um, what, what it recommends for um, how we go about uh, hiring and, and onboarding people. How do we get the right people into law enforcement in the state of Vermont? And they're also, uh, our practices are also looking at and mir mirroring national best practices. Um, and we should always never stop trying to figure out how do we streamline our process? How do we make ourselves better? And again, this is why I'm extraordinarily grateful to the PRC for, for, for bringing up something that's, that's very, very difficult to tackle. Um, since 2020, we have streamlined our hiring process. What we do is we expedite the decision processes. We use modern technology and we've incorporated emotional intelligence or EQ factors into how we hire. And, and I'll specify that more as we continue on uh, to show why. Uh, we emphasize consistent on ongoing training. So we maintain a current professional culture that we improve officer resiliency, confidence and competence, and we increase job satisfaction and fulfillment. And this is the heart of what the PRC wants us to wants to make sure that we do. I will also, uh, if I can take the time to let the council know that um, the Vermont chiefs of police are also looking at how do we how do we do this? You know, the, the chiefs in the state are trying to tackle the same question. We're having the same the same questions, same answers. How do we do this? Um, and but we're looking at processes that uh, th that are that are barriers, potential barriers to folks that are coming aboard. And I'll again dive more into that as we continue on. Um, so continuing on in the position, um, we believe that a co college education may be uh, that actually it is. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I jump ahead on that one? Yeah, I think um, I think I mashed the wrong button. Sorry, uh, we'll just go to the next one. <laughs> so. Um, Let's see, where are we at? Okay, so our position continued. Um, we think that, uh, uh, that that college education is not necessarily an indicator for a better officer. Um, we look for integrity, we look for a high uh, emotional intelligence factor and the adaptability to a career in law enforcement. That is, is this is not a sprint, this is this is a marathon. And and how do we how do we get people uh, over that line in a way that's going to be safe for them, safe for our community, and and safe for um, for the city itself. So uh, it, it's it's our belief that a higher educational requirement limits opportunities for otherwise good people who do not have access to a college education. College education is getting more expensive nowadays, even to the fact, even to the point that uh, there there's a national movement and debate and discussion as to um, college debt. 
uh, folks who are going to college in debt with the acknowledgement that it's it's a it's a financial hurdle and an obstacle. Um, and and there are of course and and which is which the PRC raised themselves throughout their internal discussions that there are many reasons people can or don't go to college. Um, we're looking at things like uh, caring for children, other family responsibilities, financial hardships, um, access to the proximity. So currently in the state of Vermont, the only way to become a police officer, um, if you've got no prior law enforcement experience, is to go to the academy for 16 weeks. All the way down, it's an hour and a half drive from Montpelier and an hour and a half drive back. So if I'm a single parent, um, and those are the people who we want to get. We want to get somebody with life experiences. And if I'm a single parent, how can I afford 16 weeks to go down to the academy every day? And then, you know, what's daycare like? What are all these different things like? And these are the obstacles and the barriers that we in law enforcement as chiefs recognize is limiting a pool of people that we need to try to reach to bring on. Because again, these are folks who have life experiences. I, I thought I knew everything before I had my daughter and I realized I don't know anything. But but having children, to be honest, really helps you understand that you can't control what people do. And the only way to do it is you, you learn how to use your mouth a little bit more than you learn how to use your physical body. So so this is a this is an untapped pool that we want to look at. Um, as we push to diversify, we already know that there are obstacles for women and minorities to attend college. There's a recommendation um, that we believe that this recommendation may have an unintended consequence to um, provide additional hurdles in attracting these pools. Um, 538 noted, and I have it quoted there at the bottom, that the race gap narrows in college, and there's a typo there, but in college enrollment, uh, but also in graduate, but but not in graduation. So again, there, there's a potential obstacle there. Uh, New York City, Chicago, New Orleans, and other municipalities and state agencies across the country are reducing these requirements, these educational requirements from mandatory associate's degree to just some type of a life experience or just just a clean um clean background um so uh and, and the private industry is doing it as well uh, Glassdoor has down there that firms like google apple ibm don't necessarily now require a college degree in, in, in majority of their positions now they, they're looking for certifications or certificates at certain schools um, to show that there's some level of technical competency to come in not necessarily a college degree to reach what it is that they need to be doing um and and what what has guided me was there's a quote that uh that chief nornson has used Used on me when we first tar started talking about streamlining this process back in 2020. And he told me that he's looking for good people because he can't teach a good person because he can teach a good person to be a cop. He cannot teach a bad person to be a good person. And, and that is our driving moniker. And that is the spirit. That is the concern. And, and, and that is what the PRC really intend, uh, uh, what they support. And, and we just have to find a way, how do we get there, especially with, with, with access and limited opportunities with where we're at now. So in continuing forward, uh, I, I would venture to say that there are a lot of studies out there that talk about um, college education as an indicator um, or correlation to reduce use of force actions. So in 2016, the, uh, one such study, the, the, the Justice Policy Journal published that uh, research findings indicate that college educated police are less likely to fire their weapons, more likely to use reasonable force, not like over the over the top force, but reasonable force to maintain control in a situation and to maintain better communication skills with the community. They're also less likely to receive community complaints. But that same study talks about the relationship between higher education and use of force complaints is weaker than in other measures that they've looked at. So for example, specifically, uh, increased field training and pre-employment tests for personal attributes, for example, personality inventories like the MMPI-2, um, polygraphs, psychological evaluations, things that we do and things that are required by the state reveal a strong association with the reduction of use of force complaints as well. And with the use of force incidences compared in, in Vermont, compared to a lot of other places that I've been and compared to other states, it's the, there's a world difference because the culture here is entirely different um, than a lot of places that I've been. Um, so, so we share that spirit with the PRC and believe that our focus is, is should be on attracting an ethical person with integrity uh, and conduct our due, due diligence to ensure adaptability and fitness. And again, for the record, this is something that the PRC strongly advocates for. And so we're definitely in agreement always there. Uh, so I'd like to give an idea of... Um, 
the uh, what happens with our current project or with our current hiring process. We've we've moved up. We've gotten gone away from just saying, hey, there's a there's a job, a position. Go to the city website, which is what the city is working on to try to update to to apply on the for a job. And and it, it's an antiquated system. And so when you get some young person, I, it used to, I used to be in the day that I, I thought I was the stuff when my grandparents would ask me to program the VCR. Now my daughter can use my phone a lot better than I can. So so things are definitely changing. So when 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 we have a younger generation who's looking at it, it's it's part of an indication that attraction level is that's that's that first impression. Where, where, where am I coming into? And, and so we have police app and police app is, is like an indeed it's like a LinkedIn. It's like, a, it, it's, it's a job uh, space for law enforcement that are the folks who are interested in going there. You go to police app, you see who's hiring and what they're doing. So, um, so that's our first step and it streamlines the process for us. So folks will apply there. And, and this is typically for somebody who has no law enforcement experience and comes in without any previous certification uh, coming into the state, looking for certification is an entirely different thing. I'm on year two, uh, June 15th is my date of hire of 2020. I am still a level two officer in the state of Vermont because the only thing that I need now is a fingerprinting class. I need to learn how to fingerprint. <laughs> so so that's that's keeping me from my level three certification so there's some antiquated stuff that's going on with the academy and the academy is aware of it the chiefs are aware of it and we're working to do our best to change it and to work with the vermont criminal justice council um so so then we we do an initial pre-screening of the application sergeant Moulton is handling this one so he'll look through just look through some open source intelligence look through some just some normal preliminary stuff see if the person is going to be a good fit is there anything in the background that that's of a concern? We will never, despite our manning situation, I'm sorry, our staffing situation, we will never compromise the standards and the expectations of this community. We won't do it. Uh, in, in, in some cases, with all due respect to those who have applied, um, if they haven't made this initial pre-screening or anywhere else, anywhere else within the hiring process, there are other agencies within the state that are calling us and asking us, Hey, you know, we're thinking about hiring this person. It's like, and and I think that's just a testament uh, to to again to us making sure we understand the strength of the recommendation of the PRC. So uh, there is that pre-screening application uh, process. Then we do an immediate follow-up and interview. It used to be in the good old days that. You go in, you put it, you put an application to become a cop. We tell you when we're ready to tell you. And, you know, or you wait to the end of the whole closeout period. And then 30 days, we'll get a hold of you. We'll have a meeting. And then you'll be sitting around with all these, all these men who will be looking at you and be very stoic. And they'll be judging you and all kinds of different stuff. We got away from that crap. What we do is we bring in people and we invite them to come do ride alongs. We invite them to come see us warts and all. Um, when we're looking good, when we're looking bad, get to know where you're coming because just as much as they're interviewing us or, or we're interviewing them, they are definitely interviewing us. This is a more savvy generation uh, entering into the workforce. So we do immediate follow-up and interviews. Uh, you also have to strike while the fire is hot because the majority of folks who have been applying for our department have applied for several others in the area. We've modernized and uh, the stream uh, streamlined the interview process. Um, then, at that particular point in time, throughout that interview, if if, it, if everything's looking good, we uh, work on a more um, in-depth background investigation. We do the uh, MMPI two, um, the uh, the physical fitness test. It used to be the old what's called the Cooper standard in law enforcement, where you had to do push-ups, sit-ups, uh, you know, a stretch, a long jump, or whatever the case may be, or run a mile and a half, and whatever distance. You know, uh, that's that's antiquated. It's especially via case law, you can't, I mean, I mean, look at me. I mean, I, I can't do push-ups. <laughs> so how can I make somebody else who's coming to the job? So it's just a measurement of cardio. So the state itself has gone away from the Cooper standard and it, it's, we're at a row standard right now just to measure the cardiovascular uh, capabilities of the person who's coming in. So there's another hurdle that we're still keeping that expectation um, and, and that standard, 
but we're modernizing it and we're looking at how does it make sense for the job that we really do on a day-to-day function. And then we've implemented critical hire, which is that EQ test. Um, and, and within your packets, you should have uh, like a sample printout of, of what that critical hire uh, is, what it looks at, and, and gives us a good read on that person in addition to the MMPI. Um, and it is blacked out in certain places just to make sure that we don't corrupt the test when if somebody gets a hold of this and they want to you know, take the test, kind of like doing a polygraph and putting that uh, that needle in your in your shoe. So every time you're going to lie, you hit it, and it's just like it's a false positive kind of thing. <laughs> so, um, so then again, we 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 look at doing. We encourage ride-alongs, different other things like that. Do that very thorough background check. Hit that polygraph, and oh my God. Uh, then there's a conditional offer of employment. And then once that offer of employment's made and folks come through, <laughs> all right. You're all welcome to the Montpelier Police Department. We just need to help you through the process, not look to defeat you through that process. So uh, this just gives a breakdown of uh, what our, our where we're at. Um, again, please see the the attached information to the packets. Um, that, that's the that's that's where we are on on uh, police app. We also have things on there that talk about what our culture is, what my leadership philosophy is. Because when when I bring folks in, I, I, I want you to ask me about anything. What's my favorite color? Cats. What do I stand on this? Where do I stand on that? Because if you're going to work with me, you need to know that the person who is, is is in charge of the department is going to meet your expectations. And I always tell folks that you don't work for me. I work for you. My responsibility is to get you everything you need to do your job and to trust you to do the to do your job correctly. And to trust folks to be autonomous, I need to send them through a very rigorous hiring process. So again, and then there's another document for the state's recruiting and hiring practices. Um, again, critical hires there. And the uh, the NDI, so there there's there, there is a, there's some participation in some states and some municipalities across the country that folks who have been decertified in other states, they, they, they collect this information, but it's like anything else. It's like, like uh, NIBRS data or uniform crime reporting data with the FBI. You have to participate to be in it. So this is something that Vermont's looking to do with this, with a lot of like act 56 and other things that are coming down within law. How do we know that if there's a person in department A who's decertified for something, how do we make sure that person doesn't jump ship from this department and then come over to another community and start that same thing? If you're not gonna be in the law enforcement profession, we don't want you to start the same crap that you started over here and bring it over to our community. We've worked too hard to make sure we have a very good culture here. Um, uh, and then one of the other recent things that we're doing is, uh, is with the Air National Guard now that they have a, uh, a system that we've become a partner with them. So when folks join the Air National Guard and they're looking for like full-time work or other things like that, there's a list of other places, like I think the Vermont Teddy Bear Company, several other places, and the Montpelier Police Department's on their website. Get a hold of us. Our personal emails are right there. You can email sergeants, the deputy chief, the chief, and say, hey, tell me what, what this business is about. What's your culture like? So I'd like to, um, this, is, this is not, this is not directly related to the PRC. This is just, I wanted to take the opportunity since we're talking about um, recruiting and retention, I wanted to give the council a, a transition into the state of things right now within law enforcement. So I, so I, I say this not to, to, to pile on to anything or to, to rebut anything that the, uh, the PRC comes. This is entirely separate uh, to, to give the background because things have changed even substantially since the PRC partnered with us to give us their feedback and their recommendations and advice. So since um, implementing Police App, and that, that happened back in December 17th of 2020, we've only had 53 submissions uh, to that. And we've only had five hires from that. Of those five hires, three people came from another agency, uh, whether I poached them <laughs> and I don't go out and say, you know, I make jokes when I'm around other agencies like, hey, what are you thinking about? You know, my pillar and all that stuff like that. You know, I make the joke. But but anytime somebody's realistically inquires about the Montpelier Police Department, I'm going to go after him like a pit bull. I'm going to tell you everything that we have to offer, but ultimately me taking from South Burlington, Burlington, Essex, any other place, it's, it's the same problem statewide. I'm just taking 
we're just robbing Peter to pay Paul. So I'm very cognizant and respectful of that. But though, but three of those people have come from other agencies. So traditional ways of people coming in has only been two. Um, and, um, and so, so basically that's a 3.77 onboard rate of already low uh, numbers that are applying for, for the department. Um, and then I also want to take this opportunity to, to, um, to, to, to tick off a, you know, whoever may be ticked off by, but, but to honestly think or to say like uh, Jeanette White uh, in the state Senate has been talking about regionalization. A lot of folks have been talking about regionalization. Um, I think we're at the point that serious discussions have to be had at municipal levels and at state levels regarding regionalization of law enforcement services. And we'll I'll tell you why I mean that. So the national and state trends, um, PERF, the Police Executive Research Forum, which is one of the fo foremost uh, experts on uh, studying law enforcement, uh, did a survey, 194 law enforcement agencies responded on workforce trends, and they found that only 93% of authorized, on average, uh, of authorized numbers are being filled. Fewer officers are hired. Resignations and retirements have increased substantially. 5% overall decrease in hiring rate from the previous years. Resignations saw an 18% increase from previous years and a 35% increase in a retirement rate. Um, this is consistent with what we're seeing in Vermont, except for our numbers are worse than that um, with, with our percentages and higher rates. And, and I say this is truth. I'm not saying this to, to throw barbs because anyone who's, who's entering into this conversation and pointing fingers is not helping anything whatsoever. We need to deal with where we're at. We need to partnership, be respectful of one another and move forward. But I have to, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that um, amongst unofficial law enforcement circles, um, people that I know from other places, people that I've been trying to recruit to come into the state of Vermont, uh, Vermont is not a state that law enforcement want, that, that folks who already have certification want to come to. And there's a myriad of reasons for that. Housing, taxes, um, a, a lot of things that the council is struggling with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but, but there's also a perception issue um, with, with relation to, to, um, to Vermont. And, um, and, and I tell them, I'm fine with where I'm at because my council supports me. And uh, my council holds me accountable. My city manager supports me, but they hold me accountable. They have expectations, as they should. They have a very, very significant job. Um, but we have support. And that's what a lot of places can't say. So that's one of my selling points when I talk to people. I let them know what that is. So um, so with this, uh, the Commissioner of Public Safety, uh, Commissioner Mike Sherling, uh, did a uh, had a memo back in 2021, and in that memo, uh, voice, we voiced concern about a staffing crisis within law enforcement in Vermont. And I'm here to tell you there is a significant staffing crisis, not only here but in the academy as well, who's probably down about 50 percent. They were understaffed to begin with, now they're down 50 percent. So with all due respect, with everything they're struggling with. He, if I get somebody, bring them to the academy, how am I going to know that there's going to be an academy class? We have, they're, they're always sending out emails saying, we don't have an instructor to do this. Can someone come down and teach us or teach this course? Um, so so, so, so this, the, the crisis is real. The current level of, of hiring does not keep pace with our reported departures and the obstacles in hiring were a lack of qualified applicants and a dwindling number of applicants. And there are several different reasons why. So, so some numbers on that is this year, um, well, I'm sorry, in 2021, uh, there were, I believe the, the, the number I had, 75 retirees and only 23 people who entered in into law enforcement in the state of Vermont or coming out of that class at the time that I got that statistic. Um, uh, looking at, uh, in last year, there was a projected uh, 102 people to retire, resign. This year is a projected of 168 retiring and resign. The average class is looking at about 25 people, if we can get them in, uh, into the academy. So again, the, uh, the academy is doing their best uh, to, to work through this, and we're all trying to rally around each other and trying to figure out how do we get through this. So uh, of the commissioners um, in his report, I've, I've cut, I've, I've clipped some of the arts, uh, some of the graphs here to give you a visualization, authorized versus actual uh, officer staffing. Um, this is back in April of 2021 is when this information was taken. The one in the bottom left talks about the respondent, uh, those who responded to the survey, what the staffing totals are. 
authorized funded positions, actual positions, and who's actually available. So I can have 17 authorized positions uh, funded. I can actually have, say, um, I'm, I'm down uh, two people. So now I have 15 people. And of those two people, one person's down, one person's on maternity leave. So now I'm really only working with 13 officers in the department, which coincidentally, we don't have anybody who's out on medical or anything, but with, with folks who we do have um, level two and, and folks who just got out the academy and still through the probationary program, we are realistically at 13 officers, including me, who's still a level two officer. And I can't go out by myself and Nord keeps me on a choke <laughs> chain so I don't get out the car. Um, Does he have a pay? Is no one just paying? He's a, he's only a two. I'm only a level two. <laughs> <laughs> So the um, so then the last graph talks about the available officer um, attrition by year. Um, so the, these are some very obviously concerning trends. And how do we how do we as leaders uh, in the state tackle this? So the the next step just talks about some um, obstacles uh, in, in attracting and retaining officers. Um, we did a uh, a study. The Vermont Chiefs of Police did a uh, a survey. Um, of the estimated, if you look like under Wikipedia or some other places, there's like an unofficial number, 1,300 law enforcement officers for the state of Vermont. I don't know how old that number is, but I, I think we have an estimated back then when we did it in 2021, 1,100 officers. Of the 1,100 officers um, in Vermont, um, no one in, in VSP participated in the study, if I recall correctly, but 330 law enforcement officers took the survey. They were motivated enough to take a survey. And, um, and they highlighted the following, that only 28% of the respondents felt that they were supported. And again, this study is part of that, part of the packet, uh, that only 28 of respondents felt that they were supported a great deal or a lot by their respective communities. 65% felt, felt little to no support by locally affected, elected officials. Nearly 87% felt little to no support by statewide elected officials. And nearly 89% felt little to no support by nationally elected representatives. So whether it's true or not, there's a perception problem. And, uh, and as we are all in the public eye, perception is unfortunately something we have to combat with. So 95% felt that their concerns and voices were not being heard or respected in conversations regarding changes in policing. Nearly 50% believe their agencies provide li provided little to no training, nor the resources or equipment needed to perform their duties and meet their responsibilities. 80% described overall morale in law enforcement as moderately low or low. 75% of respondents said they would not recommend policing to anyone as a career. Law enforcement used to be legacy. It used to be my grandfather was a cop. My dad was a cop. My mom was a cop. Now I'm going to be it. It's it's the legacies are saying, no, don't go into the job. And nearly 72% stated that they've had conversations in their household or their support systems um, of whether they should remain in law enforcement because of the current climate. That's, that's law. That's them going to family and that's family saying, I, I think you need to get out. Um, so um, why are people leaving the Montpelier Police Department? In 2021, we implemented an exit interview program. Um, of, this, of this report, um, three staff members provided the report. Since then, four members have resigned or retired from the positions, and only one of those four participated in the exit interview program. Um, his feedback is exactly um, consistent with the numbers that I'm going to discuss with you here. Um, and, and, and of the... And I'll list a few things, but working conditions, they said our working conditions is good. Again, our council supports us. Our, our, our community supports us. We're, we're good to go. Salary, they listed it as poor. Um, I want to say that the union <laughs> said big kudos to Bill and Cameron, to the city council for stepping up and for making us competitive. And, and when I put this slideshow together, uh, it was stressed to me to make sure that the council knows that we under, we appreciate what the council did and the value that the council is putting in to law enforcement. So uh, I want to make sure that that you all know this didn't come from Brian. This came from, from other people. Um, so communication with management was listed as either uh, outstanding or good. Uh, career advancement was listed as poor or that 33% is good. That's There's some things beyond our control that we can't deal with that. We're a small agency. But that, again, makes the case. Regionalization. You know, how can I get somebody you know, in succession planning? How can I get somebody promoted? How can I give somebody different responsibilities? How can I, how can I have 
have a have a, a a traffic if somebody if that's their spin is traffic if somebody's spin is 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 crisis intervention team if somebody's spin is i want to go after people who do narcotics you know uh, uh drug dealers how can i get them and funnel them and keep that fire lit on why they came into law enforcement mm-hmm. so benefits were listed as good again this is you know but but now there's there's in, in an environment that where that that municipalities are looking to poach other municipalities, and it's difficult. There's uh, since we've had our our, our contracts, um, it's it spread like wildfire. I had chiefs saying, "Hey, you know, I'm getting a whole bunch of uh, feedback here. Everybody's saying that Montpelier really hooked up." a very good contract with the union. Can I have it? Can I see yours? So I'm sending them there. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm proud of where we're at. And then come to find out that those SOBs are like at, at the starting numbers or at the starting salaries, they're beating us on the salary. So now we're right back again behind the eight ball because they're trying to, they're trying to out salary us again. So, you know, it, it's public knowledge. I had to give it to them, but you know, now I, I'll be a little bit more reluctant next time I do it. Um, so the workload is again, it's good. Uh, we make sure again that there's something to be said that every day I'm out there, I get a chance to interact with my community. I get a chance to, to help people. And I also get a chance to make a difference. Um, but not every night I'm dealing with somebody being shot. Not every night I'm dealing with, with, with parties from one end of the street to the other. Um, so the, so, so the workload here is great training opportunities, um, and then work culture and morale. Uh, so, Moving forward, so I, I would say with this one, the only thing at this point that we can control um, for this solution is our ability to attract officers and keep them here based on our culture. Um, so our current staffing numbers were a lot at 17. Um, uh, this is pretty much, again, this is what we're at. Realistically, we have two folks who are coming on. They're currently in, in uh, level two uh, training right now. I think they have one more week to go. And that's another thing. It takes two weeks. You come out as a level two officer, two weeks. Hey, I give you a gun, two weeks. Um, but um, so, so again, this is an older slide. So uh, it, it, while we take, it, it takes time to fill these positions, then it takes time to get folks trained up to the point that they can go out there and work. So um I will tell you for that second bullet there, our OT budget, um, this is the, the numbers have changed since I've done this slide. This is a regurgitation of the slide. Um, our budget is 123,000 for overtime. As of April, we had spent 183 on the budget. Um, numbers we pulled earlier this week, we're at two hundred twelve thousand four hundred ninety five dollars and 29 cents in our overtime budget. Mm-hmm. And that's for a myriad of different reasons, but the officers are burned out. And, um, we're trying to trying to deal with that. And then there may be some reimbursement in those numbers because we do have officers that are on task force and we get reimbursed through the federal government. For- just, just to be clear for people watching that, the largest part of that is for because officers are filling shifts because we don't have the people. So they're, it's not above and beyond a full complement of officers is people working overtime to make up for the lack of officers. Yes. And it's mutual aid assistance. And it's also um, the academy needs somebody down there to teach now. You know, for, for better or for worse, we're better off than a lot of other departments. Um, I can name them, Hinesburg, Norwich, Battleboro, Berlin, Hartford, um, Burlington. Um, they're in, 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 are very much worse. So I honestly don't think, and in my opinion, I don't think that they're going to be uh, uh, some places that are going to survive within the next year or two with law enforcement, which is why mutual aid is going to be so important. VSP is just not in the position. You've got captains now who are working patrol. I'm on patrol. You got captains who are on, on patrol in streets and working cases and investigations. And uh, it's, it, it's, it's legit. Um, and I'm not trying to be an alarmist, but I'm just trying to say it's, it's legit. Uh, so um, again, I, I would encourage uh, some serious conversations. I don't necessarily know if I have the right answers to those, but I would encourage some serious conversations and looking at what regionalization may look like and what mutual aid assistance may look like. Because sooner or later, we're going to end up burdening a lot of uh, help to neighboring communities. And that's where our budgets are going to end up going to. Because Montpelier is not the type of place that's going to say, ah, you're on your own. We don't, we don't do, especially in law enforcement, we don't do that. Um, so again, I apologize. Um, I kind of, uh, ram- uh, not kind of, I rambled on a lot, um, but uh, thank you all very much for your time and your uh, attention with this one. And I, I stand ready to answer any questions. Um, for, well, unless there's anything burning right now, I do want to go to um, Alyssa. Um, 
actually, I need to probably move back there because my computer's going to die. Um, but uh, Alyssa, would you like to add anything at this point? Yeah, thank you for that presentation, Chief Pete. And um, I do appreciate the department's rigorous hiring process. I know it um, from being invited to sit on a hiring panel and um, hire two of your um, corporals, I believe. So um, I've seen it up close and personal and appreciate the rigor and thought and um, community orientation that goes into it. You even let me um, make a bunch of my own questions and ask them, which I really greatly appreciated. Um, I think the PRC's recommendation, I guess I will say here, it, it in no way um, is, in a, is an attempt to indicate that the hiring process happening right now isn't rigorous. Um, so I'll just start with that. It was more the conversation, the thinking around the conversation was to allow flexibility to the department, um, which is why we didn't require an education. Uh, you know, we agree that there shouldn't have been a, um, an education standard uh, and that that could be uh, difficult in terms of the recruitment. And so that's why we have the or in there where we say, you know, one year education, you know, post-secondary education or life experience or internship experience. And um, I think we we the conversation was such that we wanted to create a broad tent, but we also appreciated some um, experience outside of, you know, the idea that um, the brain is like fully developed at age 18 to come straight out of school and straight into a police force. Um, and on patrol, um, we had done some research that indicated, you know, that life experience or the further, you know, any type of experience whatsoever, whether it be like life or community orientation, you know, life on the job or community orientation or education, all of that led to a more resilient officer. And so we were, you know, when we talked with um, some of the officers to get feedback on this proposal. I did um, personally talked with, I think it was four or five and, you know, folks it, 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 were torn, you know, saying like, yeah, you know, we don't want to close the door on, we don't want to make any recruitment any harder than it already is. And of course, if someone has a couple years of, of life experience or community um, orientation or internship experience, they're going to be a better officer, like without a doubt, but should we have that standard here? So I, I guess I'd leave that um, in your hands to the city council to figure out what to what to do with. But that was the sentiment behind. Um, we know we want our officers to have a community orientation. We know that we don't want them. Um, we know we want a resilience and judgment in that process. And, um, you know, thinking about having one year out of college. I mean, one year out of high school maybe um, isn't such a far stretch um, around, uh, as a standard, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to be, we don't want to be so restrictive that it causes, um, you know, recruitment problems in this current context. Uh, so I I'll leave it to, uh, you know, others to weigh in here. You know, I know we have a couple other committee members, maybe they're members of the public, but the, the gist was we wanted the officers to be, have a community orientation and be, have better judgment through some life community-oriented experience or education um, and be equipped for the kind of the stresses that they're going to experience in, um, you know, on the job. Oh, thank you. Um, questions for either Chief Pete or Alyssa or comments? Uh, Jack, go ahead. Thanks, Chief. It was a great, uh, very interesting presentation i i just first i'll observe that uh regionalization is a whole different uh conversation and uh and i just have to say that i approach it with some trepidation because in our work with the uh, uh with the police review commission and talking to members of the community and people who deal professionally with the Montpelier Police Department is that we look very good when we look at uh, how our police uh, 
interact with the with the public and our our police force and our values are uh, are really very positive and what I want to see out of uh, the Montpelier Police Department and and that's not true of every other police department that uh, some of the people we heard from interact with and so was one of the real pressures or tensions I think is going to be how do we preserve the values that we've tried to have our police department embody if our police department becomes part of a regional uh, force. And so I'm sure you, you're you thinking about that same uh, question. Um, with regard to this uh, particular issue of uh, hiring qualifications, there was a lot, as you know, there's a lot of discussion about, well, how, what are the qualifications? How should we, uh, how should we determine it? What, what should we be looking for? Um, and I know that uh, I I went to the uh, the police app, the Montpelier Police Department police app uh, page today. And when we talk about our qualifications, we have high school diploma or, or equivalent as a minimum. And then we have completion of college courses, military duty, or relevant work experience desirable but not required. And so I'm just curious of of the 53 people that we've had apply in the last couple of years, are most of the people coming in with just a high school education or are most people coming in with uh, with qualifications above that, either a bachelor's or an associate's degree or other of the kinds of experience that we're talking about? Yes, sir. That's a that's a very good question. I'll, I'll definitely be able to get you um, the correct uh, percentage and statistic, but I, I, I venture to say I think that the majority of applicants that we're having coming in uh, do not have uh, a college uh, degree. Uh, there there may be some with some college. There are a couple that I've specifically seen that do have college, but. Um, Sergeant Moulton and uh, Chief Nordenson have been doing that pre-screening and, and seeing what those backgrounds look like primarily. And normally when I see them uh, or see what their their backgrounds look like uh, and what their, their education level is, is normally when they get a little bit further throughout the process. So you think that uh, having uh, any kind of requirement for post-secondary education would be a real, uh, would screen out people that we want to at least be able to consider hiring. Yes, I, I think that there's, I, I, I think there's, there's that potential unintended co consequence. And and like Alyssa was saying, um, there is no substitute for life experience. Life experience helps you build a judgment. It helps you not to take things personal. It helps you not to build a, a grudge. It helps you use your mouth more than you use your fists. And uh, and and when I see somebody who's coming on the job, I'm like, oh my god, you look like my sister's or my daughter's friend in in third grade. Um, I, I look at it from the same point. Who is going to come to my house if I need some help or if my wife or my daughter needs some help? And uh, where's that judgment level going to be? Is this person going to be able to treat the community members like they would treat their own family? And um, th there's going to be no substitute for that experience. So um, so there is a, a legitimate concern there. There is a legitimate concern. And, you know, bring somebody on. And, you know, it's scary when I hear some of the old stories. Oh, yeah, you know. I went through one day of uh, an in-processing class. They gave me a gun and told me to go patrol the street. Now it's 20 years ago. I'm like, oh crap. You know, I mean, yeah. that scares any, any, any citizen. So, but, but in, in looking and in, in answering that question, I think that there may be a potential unintended consequence. I think by saying that we do prefer that, and that's something that as long as that's in the back of our mind and we're looking for that, because that does equate to life experience. That does equate to, uh, to the ability to have a more sound judgment and, and to adhere to the culture that we're trying to set. Um, so, so that is definitely a preference. And, and I, and I can tell you that if we're getting somebody who's coming in at a very, very young age, uh, we take very due care uh, and, and diligence in looking at that person's level of judgment. One, one of the people who must've been a, a defense attorney, uh, one of the things he observed is that with, uh, within the Montpelier police department, it, we, we're not seeing a lot of angry young guys 
who are on the police department, which is obviously a very good thing. Uh, it's it's good. Trevor Whipple came uh, two weeks ago to the office and gave me the uh, the. Brian, let's look at your liability. Let's look at how many use of force instances you've been in, how many injuries, how many lawsuits and everything. And, and uh, we look pretty good. He said, he said, you guys are doing very well. And especially that there's a difference in, in, in what I can see. And I, and I give that to the, the, the sergeants and the corporals into the officers and staff and dispatchers themselves, because they're policing that culture. It's not, I'm, I'm along for the ride. They're establishing that culture. That, that'd be a really interesting, uh, thing for us to see i think just what's our track record how many claims are made against us uh that kind of thing i don't think we i don't recall seeing that as part of the re police review process but you know uh, anytime we have a chance to see well what's the actual performance which i'm sure we will look pretty good thanks yes sir other comments or thoughts Connor, go ahead. I would just say great presentation. Um, it was good to hear from Alyssa, too, because I think I got a better sense of the intent um, of the language. Um, and I think, you know, like, we'll probably agree with staff recommendations in some cases, disagree in other cases. In this case, um, you know, I think the language is a bit problematic there because it does seem like it's focused on the educational piece of it. Um, and I, I definitely think, you know, a couple of things Chief is saying. Bad outcomes when we overwork uh, our force and bad outcomes when we limit the hiring pool there. Um, so I would probably uh, oppose this particular recommendation. Um, I know, like, I hire a lot of campaign operatives, right? And uh, you, you get some uh, folks, like, with poli-sci degrees from some great universities and everything. The best ones I hire are, like, uh, you know, ones who delivered pizzas, like our bartenders, <laughs> because they do have that life experience. And I think that's getting to the root of, like, what the deputy chief was uh, saying there with, you know, you can't make a, a, a bad person a good person. But, you know, I think you've shown that you've done a lot with people with limited experience who come on and become fantastic police officers. So I think that's just where, where my head's on on this one. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, thank you so much, Chief. Um, this is a really great presentation, um, really informative, and I want to thank Alyssa as well for um, all the information that you provided. Uh, and I, you know, my my heart really agrees with the the idea that we want to have those well qualified people as we can, and the arguments for life experience and for a little bit of age. And I mean, I have an eighteen year old son. I'm not sure I'd want him. Um, protecting the public safety. Um, he has lots of other gifts, but maybe not that one. And, um, and, and I, and so I appreciate the sentiment of where this recommendation has come from. Um, I am, I, I it's going to be always a very, very tough argument to make to me as a city councilor to convince me to step into a city agency, a city department and, um, tell them something so specific as as a hiring requirement um that's that feels like uh you know there may be times when it's appropriate for us to do that but it would have to be under pretty extreme circumstances um i think that the police department knows what it needs in its officers it knows the way to get that um much better than i think that we do so um so i am not inclined to support this recommendation just on that basis alone uh, but also it, the the information that we've received here is very compelling that even though there may be there can potentially be some benefits to this additional education requirement um, it sounds like they're probably fairly limited in a, in a realistic sense um, I've worked a lot in higher education including in a school that had a criminal justice program and so I know that there's a huge variety of what comes out of that. Um, there's no guarantees. Uh, and it seems like um, the, the potential uh, drawbacks that you've described are very, very compelling. And so I am also not leaning in favor of supporting this recommendation. Um, Alyssa does have her hand up. Um, Alyssa, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I, w I was hoping to drop the language into the chat because I'm hearing from um, council members that 
you're taking away that there's an education requirement and that's not in the language. And so I want to just be really clear on that. Um, and I would love to draft, I would just love to show you the language. And um, is there any way for me to drop it in there? Can I activate that or can we not do that? Um, unfortunately, we can't activate the chat. Okay. Would it be okay if I just read you the two sentences that is the recommendation, just so people have it in their mind? And I, I understand the sentiment, and I have a suggestion that I think kind of threads the needle here that for Chief Pete to consider, but I do just want you to know what the recommendation is before you vote on it. Okay. So let me just read that to you. It says, the Montpelier City Council should authorize revisions of the MPD minimum requirements for hiring officers to include one, a minimum of one year of post-secondary education or equivalent life or internship experience. And two, a demonstrated commitment to volunteer or paid community service. To and that's the recommendation. So you can see it's either education or life experience that would be relevant to the profession or an internship because we were trying to marry some experience that would gain judgment outside of high school, either education, life, or internship, and also um, a, a indication of community care and orientation. So I just wanted to make sure you saw that before you voted. And, and I hear what I hear what you're saying, but I just wanted to make sure that language is clear. And then the other thing is, um, if the council isn't interested in getting involved with this, I mean, Chief P, what you have on your website that Jack read um, earlier, it is very similar to the sentiment that we're already we were already saying at the PRC. Like you're basically saying you need to have um, a high school education, plus you'd love for them to either have some other education or some other life or internship type experience or community engagement. Like it, it feels like what you already have written is really close to what the recommendation is. And so I almost wonder if it's worth just a follow-up conversation to around that paragraph that you have to kind of get at that sentiment um, as a, as a, you know, preferred or option. And if that's just worth another conversation, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thanks. May, may I respond? Oh, uh, for really sure. Briefly, Go ahead. Uh, just, I, I would, I would say that, yes. Um, and again, the, we do internships now and, and guess where some of that motivation came from. <laughs> so we, we we acknowledge the partnership um and and the strength of of you know bringing ideas out we can't see the trees or the the, for, or the forest from the trees and uh so so that is another way that we're looking at it the pipeline is, is getting folks to come in do internships and move forward from there so uh, again i i think that um our, our spirit is, is is definitely in cohesion uh we are partners in this and we're we're we're, we're definitely in, and i know that the council doesn't have that have that uh, that sentiment, but I just wanted to put it out there for everybody who's watching is that um, uh, the PRC and the Montpelier Police Department are, are very much in sync, especially with the um, the spirit of the recommendations, because we're all trying to tackle the same concerns that have universally plagued our profession. Lauren, go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, I love the idea of looking at that line because that strikes me too, as it's trying to get at the same sentiment um, and really appreciate the presentation and walking through. And I know it came out in the PRC process, the challenges with law enforcement hiring right now, and it sounds like it's gotten even worse since then. Um, so, I mean, to me, I think in large part, even just sparking the conversation we're having tonight and putting a spotlight on the sentiment and the, you know, how this feeds into the culture and hearing how you're working to kind of embody this in the hiring practices. I mean, I think that's a, a going a long way to getting at what the PRC and having that as part of the recommendation to kind of live on in that document as um, kind of a, a placeholder for continuing this conversation and making sure we're keeping an eye on hiring practices and all that. So, I mean, to me, I I think I love the idea of trying to just see if there's a way of, um, you know, any tweaking of that language that you already have as a, you know, however it's preferred but not required or whatever. Um, but I don't think we need to adopt a policy tonight. I think that seems like a great approach to me. Now, you know, the, one of the things that you said, Chief, that is 
sort of sticking with me is that if there was a, a position that needed to be filled and you didn't find someone that you felt was the right fit, then you just wouldn't fill it. Did I, am I, is that accurate? It's very accurate. And it's also something that the officers themselves, right. Uh, and, and they understand that they, they tell us all the time, don't put another body in here just to put a body in here. Right. Somebody in here is going to do the work. And, and that to me is a, like a really hard thing to capture um, because what I feel like I heard, well, what I think is hard to capture actually is, is this sentiment that Connor referenced about like, you can't teach a necessarily a bad person, be a good person. And then like, how, but what does that mean? And how do like, it, I feel like it relates to the process that you talked about, like with the polygraph and with the emotional um, qual- quality um, testing. Is that what it's EQ? Is that uh, emotional intelligence? Oh, emotional intelligence. Okay, cool. Um, right. So, you know, there are ways to try to get at that, but then like, how do you, like, <laughs> do you turn that into a policy? And I'm not sure that that is something that's so easy to, to just say that, you know, that's our standard, right? Like, I'm not sure that I've, I've mixed feelings about that um, as well, rather than even just, you know, li- like life experience might lend towards that or, you know, college experience might lend towards that, but not necessarily kind of what you were saying, Carrie, about how, you know, you can go through an experience and get all kinds of outcomes of folks, you know, at the end. Um, so I guess all, all that is to say, I, um, I'm also not in a place where I'm ready to, uh, you know, adopt uh, policy, different minimum standards right now. Um, but, you know, if we do, it feels like there's something there um, beyond like, education or experience that is what I heard you say, um, which I feel like was clear from the presentation. But anyway, I guess I'll, I'm going to stop talking <laughs> at this point. Um, Donna, yeah. I think some of what you're trying to get at is that whole subjective aspect, yeah. and you can't put it there. And that's why you hire put confidence in your chief or your city manager who does hiring. And, and that's where you let go of it. So I'm, I don't think we need to change what's there. We can modify it, but I think we do our due diligence with our city manager and with hiring the right chief. I'm getting the sense that we're probably not going to change things tonight. Um, and if folks want to have more conversation about like the what's on the website, I mean, certainly open to revisiting this at some other time. Um, if that's if that's what folks want to do, but I'll leave that to the police review committee to work with the chief on. Is that sufficient? Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chief, for this great presentation. Thank you, Alyssa. And please pass on our gratitude uh, to the police review committee. Um, you know, at this, it's uh, yeah. I, I appreciate that the sentiment that this um, suggestion encapsulated was also sort of very close to um, what was on the this um, the website. So yes, Donna, go ahead. Just one of the pieces, you sent us a lot of material, uh, which was made a great picture, but the one that I really was impressed with that you shared evaluations of people who exit. And I think you almost need to require people to do an exit <laughs> form. Um, really some sort of enticement because it's so helpful to hear those comments. So thank you. It was very helpful. Yes, ma'am. And, and thank you for that. And, and if I may, um, this, the city already has an account with Poco, who reached out to me again today. They also have another tool that will help us not only reach out to the community to find out where we can you know, improve our communications and, 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 and legitimacy, but there's also an internal component that we can send out random polls that are anonymous that um, fill this out and, and how are we doing? And, uh, and and they can track me, they can track Chief Norrinson and the sergeants, and we, we all track each other to keep ourselves accountable to make sure that we are leaning into a direction that we're not hemorrhaging talent. Um, and I think that's extraordinarily uh, uh, valuable to us because I'd rather know before you walk out that door how I'm screwing up and how I can fix it. So uh, yeah. that's something that we're actively looking into right now. Okay. Thank you. Um, Lauren, did you have anything you want to add? Just 
really briefly, it came up earlier, um, gratitude for the um, public meeting that you're convening tomorrow night. And just wanted to, I mean, very much in line with other recommendations of the police review committee and the spirit of how, you know, and things that are kind of traumatizing for the community um, are happening, how we're engaging. And so just grateful that's happening. And, you know, we'll be interested to hear how it goes and if there's ongoing, but I think, you know, in terms of just, yeah, kind of best practices for how we're actually responding and giving people a venue to talk through and process together as a community. So I'm really um, happy that's happening. So just want to express that. Yeah, I agree. Okay, thank you. All right. No, I just want to acknowledge that it is quarter after 10. I would like to do this next item. <laughs> is that okay? Yeah. How fast do you, you think? Skipping, Mike? Okay. How... This is going to be fast. Celtics are at halftime. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm smart enough to know I'm not turning these lights out for a PowerPoint presentation. So Mike Miller, planning director. Um, so you have in your packet the proposed fee schedule and uh, and uh, the existing fee schedule. And I'm just going to go really quickly through some of the reasons why um, we're, I'm here needing to update the fee schedule. And this really comes back to 2018, the zoning update that we did. And one of the major goals of the 2018 zoning update was to streamline the permitting process. And the numbers you saw that were in your packet, which which had the the numbers was in 2017, the DRB had 74 hearings and we issued 74 administrative permits, pretty much 50-50. 2021, there were 19 DRB hearings and 124 administrative permits. Why that's important is that the DRB hearings, not only do they take a lot longer, but they also cost people a lot more money. There's a lot more fees involved. So in 2017, we collected $30,000 in fees. And in 2020, we collected 13,000, 21, 15,000. I think we're about 16,000 right now. So pretty much we cut our fees in half. Uh, the other change that happened from 2018 is uh, the amount of support that we provide applicants through the process. Our, um, our staff works very hard. Um, Meredith came on board in 2018. Uh, and so she provides a lot more, and we encourage a lot more handholding for applicants. If you come in, you don't need to know the zoning. And a lot of it was new zoning. So we told people, don't learn the zoning. We know the zoning. Just email Audra and we'll handhold you through the process. And we pretty much have continued to do that. That's, that's our policy now is you don't have to fill out applications and bring them to us and we review them. You email us and you say, I've got an idea. I want to put a deck or I want to put a shed or I want to open a new business. Here's my address. Can you tell me what I need to do? We read all the zoning. We send you all the documents. We tell you whether you can or can't. And, and so we really, that, so the amount of work we do for each project is much more than it used to be. Um, so those are the things. We're collecting less money and we're doing more work. Um, in the fee schedule, the things that are not changing, um, so we have building fees and we have zoning fees. The building fees portion isn't changing. That's pegged to the state. We have a contract with the state. Um, if we weren't doing building permits, the state would be. So uh, Chris Lumber does the building permits and we charge the same fees that the state does. And the overall structure of our of our zoning fees hasn't really changed. That the layout is all still there. Some things moved around, but overall it really hasn't changed. Um, so what has changed is um, some of the quick highlights. Some, the the, the ideas in new construction previously had really been tied to use, and it the, how it was calculated varied, and it was really kind of all over the map. And what we've done is kind of simplified everything to a square footage. So all building construction is 30 cents a square foot with a couple of different minimums for accessory because accessory structures don't take as much work. So they'll have a less minimum. Um, and non-building construction is a flat rate $50. So non-buildings, a building is anything with four walls and a roof. So non-building is something that misses one of those. So a porch, a deck, a swimming pool, a fence, non-buildings. Um, those would be a flat $50. Changes of use um, uh, stayed the same. We increased fees for minor site plans and design review, and this really is because of the amount of work that we do. Um, the staff does a, a lot of, of work. These were completely new. 
Um, previously, there were no minor site plans. Every site plan went to the DRB. And now what we did with the 2018 rules is said, some of these don't need to go to the DRB. We can do these administratively, but we really weren't charging enough for the amount of work we were doing. Um, in the flood hazard permits, we added a new category for minimal, which we made cheaper. So we tried to just reflect the amount of work that we have to do with the amount of the, the proposal. Um, so we actually made those cheaper, but increased the fees for the other ones, which we do a lot of work for. So if you're in the flood hazard area, we help you because the NFIP rules, National Flood Insurance Program rules, are very complicated. And again, Audra's a, a certified floodplain manager. She helps people through those process and spends a lot of time working on those. So we should increase the fees a little bit. Um, some other changes. When you go to the DRB, we now provide much more uh, assistance. We write much more complete staff reports. Meredith does a lot more work than, than previous zoning administrators did in that realm. So we've increased the fees um, from $50 to $100. I would note on the, the, the new zoning fee schedule under appeals, um, I'd like to recommend that uh, there be a reimbursement of fees for an appellant if they win. So in a zoning administrator appeal, somebody's basically making the argument, you screwed up. And if you make the case that says you screwed up and you go to the DRB and the DRB says, yep, the zoning administrator screwed up, it just seems fair that in the very least we should reimburse them their, their appeal fees. So um, we don't have that ability right now. So that is, is in here um, as, a, as one of the notes on the side. Um, the recording fees are set by the clerk's office. They were most recently updated in 2019. So those are all accurate at this time. Um, and then what we did to kind of ground truth these is we ran a couple of recent permits through some small, like a fence and a deck permit. Right now that would cost you about $130. Under the new system, it would cost you $130. We really weren't looking to increase the costs of these small permits. Um, but as you get to the ones that take more work by staff, conditional use DRC review, currently it would cost 425. Under the new system, it would cost 550. Um, a new accessory structure um, being uh, to a commercial use. So a commercial business is adding an accessory structure in the design review district. That's $340 today, 430 under the new rules. So it goes up about 90. And then uh, app, application four is a big project, a 10,000 square foot residential project in the design review district, major site plan, waiver, river hazard. Currently, we, we charged $1,530. That would go up to $3,900. As much as $3,990 sounds like a lot of money. That particular project is about a $6 million project. So adding an extra couple thousand for the amount of work that our staff has put into that to make that project get to the finish line. Um, that isn't unreasonable. We also compared these to um, similar sized communities um, and these were uh, comparable to or less than most of the other communities um, like our 30 cent per square foot rate. In Heinsberg, it's 50 cents. So we're significantly less than Heinsberg. If, we were doing a, if you were doing a similar project in Heinsberg and in Montpelier, you'd pay significantly less here. Um, our goal wasn't necessarily to drive up to fully replace that 50% loss. We just wanted to recapture more funds. And if we have to, we can come back next year and keep kind of adjusting things a little bit. Our, so our goal really wasn't to kind of come through with a wholesale, let's really jump up the rates. We just wanted to go through and kind of, kind of make a tweak, get some things some of the things in our fee schedule were missing. Some of them really weren't classified right. We really wanted to kind of make things fairer. So these small projects, occasionally we'll get a thing like a flagpole for a business that'll cost somebody $500 for a permit. And we're like, that doesn't make any sense. They're $500 for that, but this person over here is building a huge building for you know 330, um, which we spent a lot of time working on. So we really just tried to balance a few of these things out. Um, and that's what you have before you. And if you've got any questions, I will take them. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I particularly appreciate that uh, these rates are not as much as surrounding communities. That's great. And that we it's important that we get paid for, uh, you know, time spent. So I'm in favor of uh, approving this. 
Would anybody like to discuss it or make a motion? I'll make a motion that we approve the amended zoning and building fee schedule as proposed. Second. Further discussion? Yes, Don. Just a comment. I mean, it, it really is more than just the time of night. I mean, you sent us all this material yes. and initially it was like, oh my heavens, <laughs> but you sent it all to us. Thank you very much. It makes it all easier when you come tonight. Agreed. Okay. Any, uh, anyone online wish to make a comment? Okay. Uh, any further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please. Oh, oh okay. Yes, oh. Jack. I just uh, want to say that, you know, for years, you know, when I was on the uh, Barriers to Housing Development Committee, which was 10 or 15 years ago, I'm not sure exactly how far, but Montpelier's always had this reputation as being hard to work with. You can't get uh, approved to do anything. You can't build anything in Montpelier. And, and the fact that you're, the, the evidence shows the opposite. And the fact that you're doing all these permits administratively without making people go through uh, DRB is, uh, is, is really, one, it shows that the changes we made to the zoning ordinance a few years ago have really worked. But two, it really shows that Montpelier wants to do exactly that, wants to make it easier for people to... Uh, to put their property to uh, to productive use. And so I think this is a, a good reflection on on the department. Thank you. Yeah, I agree. Um, further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Yeah. Okay, uh, we are up to council reports, Donna. I do want to commend you, Mayor Watson. I thought you handled yourself extremely well tonight. And it was not a, a meeting I hope to repeat because it really stayed with me. Uh, but um, on the lighter note, I want to encourage people to go to the Mountaineer Games. They've started. And I also want to give people a heads up that the Berry Street bike path that's going in temporarily with lines and some very tall white cone-like things will We'll be starting at the end of June, 1st of July. We're having a little bit of issue as to when they're exactly going to get the lines painted. But the intention is to have it operating in, through July and August into September. So heads up, that's happening. Letters are going to be written to go to the neighbors and the businesses. Thank you. Thank you. Carrie. Uh, I don't have to this. Okay. Uh, Connor. Uh, just a plug for this Saturday, uh, Gun Sense for Month and March for Our Lives and uh, Moms Man to Action. We're hosting the March for Our Lives uh, rally that'll be on the State House lawn. Two o'clock, good lineup of uh, speakers there. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, Jack. Thank you. I just uh, want to comment briefly on uh, the events of earlier uh, this evening um, because we've heard repeatedly that our time limits are illegal and um, this or that thing that we do is illegal. It's true that uh, the city council is required to hold meetings that are public and that are open to the public. However, I want to point out from the statute, it says at an open meeting, the public shall be given a reasonable opportunity to express its opinions, opinion on matters considered by the public body during the meeting. As long as order is maintained, public comment shall be subject to reasonable rules established by the chairperson. And uh, it's just essential that we be able to have a public meeting doing the public business and, uh, be permitted to proceed through the course of our agenda without unreasonable disruption. I uh, support the action the mayor took tonight. Thank you. I'm Lauren. Okay. Um, I want to acknowledge that graduation is happening on Friday. So congratulations to all the graduates. Um, it's very exciting. Um, and, uh, yeah, uh, 
I think I'll I think I'll leave it at that tonight. Um, it's been an interesting evening. Um, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it there, Crystal. Um, I will just remind people that water and sewer bills are due next week on the fifteenth. And I was going to pass, but I, I do feel um, I've already sent this out to you, but we did get an appeal of a violation of the open meeting law that the two minute rule is um, a violation and also an alleged illegal gathering of a quorum of the council outside of council chambers unwarned. Um, so we will have to there's respond to that within, you know, we'll probably have to call a special meeting of some sort within a certain number of days. Okay. I've already forwarded it all to our attorney. But. Okay. And um, what theoretically would we do at the, at such a meeting? Well, we've had a couple of these yes, already. Yes, so yes. we would have a finding. Um, yep. uh, you know, I don't want to prejudice what the finding would okay, be. Okay. Okay. But for example, so we would hypothetically, have... if we adopted what Councilmember McCullough just said, we would say we deny that okay. the two minute is a violation. Uh, 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 okay. And we would say something potentially of the effect of, yes, there was yeah. a quorum of the council gathered for a personal reason yeah. with one of the council members and no discussion okay. was uh, held and no Just discussion with Chief Pete was held because that was the allegation. Okay. Um, and okay. yes, we did inadvertently have mm, Okay. Okay. No Theoretically. Theoretically, that could be okay. an answer. Okay. Or or uh, to yeah, go ahead. make another example, I think one of the, there's a challenge to, where someone pointed out that we had an electronic meeting and not everybody had to introduce themselves right. at the beginning of the meeting. And so we just held the meeting and pointed and issued a statement. Yes, that's true. Right. We okay. overlooked that requirement. Okay. So that's the kind of thing. That's the kind of thing that we might do. Okay. But I think, it, you know, in... We can talk about. It. I think it would be important to emphasize that no city business was being conducted. Inadvertently, more than yeah. four people gathered okay. to talk to one council member about a personal concern. Okay. Okay. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you all, um, and thank you all who are still here and still with us online. Um, very grateful. Okay. With that, uh, we will consider the meeting adjourned, 1031.